Welcome, everybody. Glad you were all able to find your way in. I know a few people were having a little bit of trouble finding the password. Um, Mike or Ming, if you could add that to just maybe the, the link to uh, the Zoom meeting and the password into the Slack channel, just in case we have a few others that are having problems finding it, that would be great. Yeah, I can do that. Thanks, Mike. And then we'll just give everybody just one more minute to log in after Mike gets that posted. Thanks for doing that, Mike. Looks like we're still ticking up on participants, so we'll wait one more minute here. I think I noticed that we have participants in something like eight different time zones. So thank you all for joining us um, from wherever you are. Uh, we really appreciate you being here today. Um, so I'll go ahead and welcome you to the first UFS or Unified Forecast System Medium Range Weather Application Users Training. Uh, this training has been put together by the Developmental Testbed Center um, NOAA's Environmental Modeling Center, EMC, and Geophysical Fluid Dynamics Laboratory, or GFDL, and NCAR's Climate and Global Dynamics, or CGD Laboratory. So um, quite a number of instructors and subject matter experts that will be with us during this training event um, to provide you with information on how to um, get up and running with the medium range weather application. So on this first page, I do show the agenda. Hopefully you all have access to that and have made your way there and there's a password included. So if you, um, if you need a second now to go ahead and find that page, that would be great. Um, this will kind of be our home base. Everything is accessible from there, including the links to the Zoom meetings and uh, the practical sessions later through Google Meet. And then as well as our practical session is all online and, and available from that page as well. So um, that'll be a good place to bookmark and have accessible throughout um, as well as the Slack workspace. So we will be using the Slack workspace um, to ask questions and, and um, provide any additional comments that we need to along the way. So hopefully you all have had a chance to get access to that and are able to um, post there as well. If you have any problems with any of this, please don't hesitate to reach out. Um, you can raise your hand in here and we can try and address that. Or if you wanna send me an email, we can address it offline. Um, either way is fine, so. Let's see. All right, so um, I'd like to start this morning by introducing all of our instructors and subject matter experts not all of them are likely to be on because you know, we have a variety of people that will be appearing on different days throughout this training session. Um, but we will go ahead and, and introduce those that are. So if uh, I'll just go through alphabetical order and I've got it listed here so you can kind of um, have a heads up. But if you wouldn't mind unmuting and providing your name, your affiliation, and then what areas or components you are involved in with UFS um, that would be really helpful for the students then to know um, who they might be talking to about if they have a question about a particular component. So we'll go ahead and um, open this up. And it's hard for me to see everybody that's on, but Todd, are you on? No, no Todd. 
All right, so Jeff, you get to go first then. All right, can everybody hear me? We can. All right. Uh, so yeah, my name is Jeff Beck. I work at NOAA GSL, um, mostly on um, short range weather app, uh, UFS uh, matters, um, but I'm here uh, to help with the uh, pre-processing component of the medium range weather app uh, with George Gano. So I'll be available during the um, practical sessions. And uh, I also help put together some of the presentation material for the pre-processing uh, talk. Great, thank you, Jeff. Sure. Leisha, I think I saw you. Yeah, hi, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Great, uh, so my name is Ligia Bernardet. I work here in Boulder at uh, the NOAA Global Systems Laboratory. Um, I have been involved in uh, preparing the public release for this UFS uh, medium range weather app. And today I will be presenting the overview of the app. And uh, I, in general, work uh, quite a bit of time on the CCPP, which is the Common Community Physics Package, the physics library that is used with the UFS along with the framework uh, to connect this physics library to the, the host model, the, the UFS. Uh, yep, that's it. Great, thank you, Leisha. Lori, we'll toss it over to you. Um, hello, everybody. I'm glad everybody could make it today. Uh, my name is Lori Carson. Um, I work at NCAR in the DTC, the Developmental Testbed Center. Um, I'm a software engineer and my focus is on the building and running of the medium range weather app today. I'll be giving that presentation and then helping with the practical sessions as well. Awesome. Thank you, Lori. Shan Hui? I don't know if I saw. All right. Okay, we'll skip. Uh, she, are you on? All right, uh, let's see, Grant, I think I saw you. Yeah, I'm here, hi. Awesome. Uh, uh, my name is Grant Furl. Um, I'm affiliated with uh, NCAR and the Developmental Testbed Center. And my uh, work with the UFS is prim primarily through the Common Community Physics Package or CCPP. Great, thanks Grant. George. Hi, I'm uh, George Gano. I'm affiliated with EMC, and I work on the pre-processing uh, programs, in particular, the Change Res Cube program. Excellent. Thanks, George. Let's see, I don't know if I saw Kyle. Kyle, are you there? All right, and Lucas? Okay, I did see Dom. Yes, I'm here. Awesome. So hi, my name is Dom Heinzler. I am working in Boulder at NOAA GSL and DTC, the Developmental Testbed Center. Um, my main job is the development of the CCPP that Lisa just mentioned beforehand, the Common Community Physics Package. Um, I'm also one of the U of S code managers and in that capacity involved in the public releases of the medium range weather and the upcoming short range weather app. And I'll be presenting um, on Monday, November 9, next week um, on the CCPP for developers. Great, thanks, Tom. Tracy. Oh, you're really hard to hear, Tracy. Is that better? Oh, that's much better. Yep. Sorry, I didn't forgot to put my headphones in. No worries. Um, yeah. <laughs> I'm Tracy Hartnicki, and I am with NCAR and the DTC as well, the Developmental Testbed Center. And I work primarily with the unified post processor that's used for post processing the model output for both the medium range and short range weather apps. Great. Thanks, Tracy. Sure. Ming. Hello? Hey. Okay. 
Hi, uh, I'm Minghu, and uh, I'm working with uh, GSL from NOAA side of the DTC, and I'm here helping the helping Jamie and Mike to organize this uh, tutorial. And uh, my focus uh, research area is develop the regional NRP system, and uh, I'm basically focused on more focused on the data simulation side. All Thank right. you. Thanks. Thanks, Ming. Mike. Uh, hi, my name is Mike Kavulic. Um, many of you will have already heard from me via email or Slack uh, for setting up your various computer accounts. Um, I'm an associate scientist at NCAR in the Developmental Testbed Center, um, like many people here. Um, I work on a few different projects related to the UFS, including the Short Range Weather App and the Unified Post Processor. Um, and I will be giving a talk on Monday's developer session about uh, code management and making contributions to the UFS. All right, thanks, Mike. Weiwei, are you on? Yeah, can you hear awesome. me? Yes. Great. Uh, I'm Weiwei Li. I work for NCAR and DTC. Uh, I have been primarily involved in the test and evaluation activity for the global model of the UFS, especially to evaluate the model physics component. Today, I'll be helping uh, leaning Pan on the scientific overview of supported physics suite of the CCPP. Great, thanks so much. Feng Lin. Um, hi, this, okay, video is working out. This is Feng Lin Yang, I'm from NCP UMC. And I had been working on the development and the transition to operation of the global forecast system in the past. And recently I transitioned to leading the physics development effort at the EMC um, for, the, for the UFS. I'll give a talk on Friday and to review the GFS development uh, in the past uh, a few decades. All right, thank you. Uh, Lin Lin. Can you hear me? Uh, we can. Hi, I'm Lin Lin Pan. I work in uh, Lua GSL and uh, DTC. I mainly work on uh, UFS CTPP. I will give a presentation on scientific overview of supported uh, physics suites. Thank you. Thanks, Lin Lin. Ricky. Uh, <clears throat> hi, I'm Ricky Rood. I'm a professor in the climate and space sciences and engineering department at the University of Michigan. My role with the UFS is I am one of the co-chairs of the Unified Forecast System Steering Committee, and I will be presenting a brief overview of the UFS and our um, plans in the near-term future. Great. Thanks, Ricky. Uh, Julie. Uh, hi, my name is Julie Schramm, and I'm a software engineer at NCARS DTC. Uh, I work on the two releases of the uh, medium range weather app 1.0 and 1.1. I've provided a lot of the documentation for that. I also work on the short range weather app. The release will hopefully be in the next month or two. And uh, my specialty in for the medium range weather app is uh, building and running it. And I helped Lori put together a talk this morning on how to do that. And I'll be helping all of you in the practical session this afternoon and the next few days if you have any questions. That's Great. it. Thanks, Julie. Uh, Ufuk. Hi, good morning, everyone. Uh, I am a Fukturin Cholo. I am working at NCAR as a part of CGD group. So I was working in a team that responsible to create the application, basically the same case control system integration. And I will give a presentation about that today. I am also working on the HAFS application. It's a regional FE3 GFS, UFS ATM and HICOM coupled. And I am also working on the data component integration in the coupled modeling system in the, as a part of the HAFS uh, uh, application. Thanks. Excellent. Thank you. All right. Um, my name is Jamie Wolf, and I work at NCAR with the D DTC or Developmental Testbed Center. And I'm one of the organizers for this particular training event that's happening today. 
Um, but mostly I'm working on the short range weather application as part of the UFS. So um, that is me. And then Lin, Lin, Lin Jiang, I think I saw you on. Hi, this is Lin Jiang. Yeah, I work on the FE3 dynamical call and the traffic on my faces. Thank you. Great, thank you. Um, let's see, I think Lu I saw Lucas jump on. Lucas, would you like to do a quick introduction? If you're there. Can someone hear me? I can hear you. Okay. Yeah, this is Lin Zhong. I work on the every time every free dynamic call and the shift microfaces. Great. Thank you, Lin Jiang. Do Thank you know you. if um, Lucas or Xi or Zhan Hui are going to be here this morning for an introduction? Yeah, Lucas and Zhang Hui, uh, they, they haven't joined the Slack uh, yet, so they don't know the information okay. and I forgot to t tell them earlier. And see okay. um, his family having a baby right now, so he's not coming. Well, that's a good excuse. <laughs> Congratulations to them. I hope all goes well. Awesome. Okay. Uh, well, thank you all for introducing yourselves. Uh, is there anybody that we missed? Did Todd jump on since we started? And if not, I think we covered everybody. Okay. Um, this is just a brief overview of our agenda for the next few days. Uh, so today we will have our, the overview of UFS by Ricky, and then Leisha will talk about the overview of specifically about the medium range weather application. And then we'll get into actually running that application. So um, Lori will talk about the building and running and Ugluk will go over the SEAM case control system. So that'll be today. And then this afternoon, we'll have our practical session that will be focused mostly on building and running a basic um, application <clears throat> with the medium range weather for this first day. Into tomorrow, we'll start looking um, at the NCEP libraries and the pre-processing code. Um, and then we'll get into CCPP, the physics suites, and GFDL's um, FE3 uh, dynamic core. And then the practical session tomorrow will be focused a lot on um, if you want to change your suite definition file or run a new date, um, things that you would be doing with the, the pre-processing and CCPP aspects. And then the la Friday will focus on um, the development uh, and transitions to operations. So the, the actual physics suite that's run in operations, Fanglin will discuss that some. And then <clears throat> Tracy will talk about the unified post-processor. And then we'll have some price bill session time to focus in on using the post processor as well. So um, at the end of Friday, we will give a short overview of the short range weather application, which as Julie mentioned, um, we're hoping to have released in the next month or two. So um, that will be uh, at the end of the day on Friday. And then going into Monday, we'll do some more of the developer focused areas code management, making contributions to the repositories, and then um, some developer um, specific information for CCPP. And then we'll follow that up or end, end our um, training session with some open discussion and special topics on Monday afternoon. So that's a brief uh, overview of the agenda. Um, and you, can, you have access to the webpage um, as I mentioned earlier, and all of this information is there. Um, but if you do have any issues, please feel free to use the Slack channel to ask questions. And then um, just a few reminders as we go through here. Please remember to mute yourself unless you're presenting or asking a question. Um, and then just in order to reduce bandwidth and distractions, if you wouldn't mind turning off your camera unless you are speaking, uh, that would be helpful. Um, it just less distractions and, and things um, to watch, watch other people on their camera. So um, please go ahead and feel free to turn that off. If you are speaking, um, you can decide if you want to have your camera on or off. Either way is totally fine. Um, in terms of the Slack workspace, we're going to be using this mostly for questions and comments during the, the training event. Uh, we do have a general uh, Slack channel that you can put, post any logistical issues or questions that you're having. 
Um, and then we have a presentations channel. So as we go through the presentations in the morning, mostly of each day, um, feel free to ask any questions related to those lectures in that channel. And then at the end of the lecture, we will um, be sure to ask any of those questions of the um, presenter. Uh, we also have the practical session channel where as we do the hands-on work um, in the afternoons, you can ask questions there. And then there's a feedback channel. So if you have any comments uh, or suggestions regarding how this went, if there's something that you think could be improved upon, um, please don't hesitate to provide that feedback as well. We definitely wanna make sure that uh, this training is useful and um, providing you with the information you need. So um, please feel free to give us feedback there. So in terms of Zoom, we will be using this platform for all of our lectures. Uh, so again, post your questions to the Slack channel. Um, if you would prefer to ask your question live, um, there is a feature that you can raise your hand through Zoom. Um, so if you wanna go ahead and raise your hand and then at the, we'll have you unmute and ask your question. Um, we will be moderating that and so we can um, watch for you to raise your hand if you'd prefer to just ask your question live that way. And then in the afternoons, we'll be using Google Meet for all the practical sessions. Um, again, you can feel free to unmute and ask your question at any time during that, that hands-on practical session. It will be more of an open forum type format. So um, we'll all be there. Um, people can unmute and ask questions um, as if we were in a computer lab all together. Um, some other user might hear your question and think, oh, I was wondering that too, and might gain some information that way. So um, don't be shy, feel free to ask, ask that way. Um, but we also have the Slack channel if you prefer just to type your question in there. And then if it becomes necessary during the hands-on practical session time uh, that you are really struggling or need some uh, specific assistance with something, um, we will have one of the instructors initiate their own Google Meet and send you the link so that the two of you can go and have a separate session where you can screen share and receive that one-on-one -on -one assistance as necessary. So um, that's the plan. We'll kind of see how that all goes. Uh, if, if it's not working, we'll definitely make some changes to make sure that um, you are getting the one-on-one -on -one that you need and all of your questions are being answered. So with that, um, that's all I had. Are there any issues that need to be raised at this point? Does, um, feel free to raise your hand. Um, is there anything in the Slack channel that we need to be aware of, Mike or Ming? Um, we'll open it up here for questions or comments. Uh, just someone asked the slides uh, for the speaker for the presentation is not posted publicly, but it will available later and with all, rec all the recorded presentations, just some information. Yeah, good point. That's not something I mentioned, but we are going to record these sessions and make them available um, after the fact. So um, they, will be, they will be available to go back and watch again if, if need be. So yeah, thank you for that comment. This is Ricky. Will you be making them available as single entities or will you be making them available as one large? Um, the plan is to make it available as one large um, session. Okay. Um, I would like a single, if you have a presentation that of, of mine that is single entity that I might be able to edit, I might be interested in that. Um, okay. I also had a, an odd logistical question. Are, are the participants from NOAA using Zoom? Yeah, so um, they are able to use the web Zoom based, but um, maybe not the application. Okay, okay. And not allowed to host, but UCAR is hosting, so um, that's not an issue. I've, I've just been curious because this has been a problem with the steering committee meetings, so. Yeah, it sounds like they are able to, and I'm not Noah, so I shouldn't be answering this question, but um, it sounds like they are able to use it in um, certain specific cases for specific. Uh, yes, only we can open from web browsers. Um, that's, uh, there's no problem. So. Okay. All right, 
right, anything else? Okay. Well, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. So will we be um, presending the slides from our screen or are you going to present them from the You You can workshop. go ahead and present them from your screen unless we need, um, we have the backups if we need to, if there are some issues with you presenting. Everyone right. should be presenting from their own screen. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Ricky. So um, let's see, I'll, I'll go ahead and introduce you, Ricky. So Ricky will be pre presenting our first um, presentation today. And let's see, sorry, I'm just trying to get back to my right window here. Um, so Ricky will be presenting a, an overview of UFS for us today. Um, and again, I remind you, if you have questions along the way, please feel free to raise your hand or type them in the Slack channel. And Ricky will, you can go ahead and share your screen if you want to. Um, I'm tr trying to so I shared my screen, but the slide looks very small. Ricky, did you happen to share the there you go? So that didn't hmm. that still looks small to me. I don't know how it looks to you. Yes, it does look quite small. Um, did you happen to share the application or the, your entire desktop? Looks like your whole. I desktop. just shared that. So what I'm going to do now is uh, I'm, going to, I'm going to stop the share. I'm going to share the screen again. So you think I should choose? So I was sharing the desktop. Do you think I should choose? That's that ordinarily is the best option. Okay. Try, try, try sharing your application. There you go. And now if you press present. Then it opened it up in that other, on my other screen in the small window. Yes, that happened for us too. We can't see your full screen. Um, so you will need to share your desktop again. So stop sharing now. Share your entire desktop. Desktop one or two? Uh, which screen is your presentation mode going on? Presentation mode is going on desktop one. So that's the one you'll need to select. Okay. Having multiple screens may be fouling you up. Okay, I'm going to then disconnect my screen. And, and then what are you seeing now? We're seeing your browser. If you could go to the full screen, please. There you go. And yeah. if you go to the full screen with that little box icon, there we go. We've got it now. Okay. Thanks. Okay. So the trick there was removing the extra screen. Um, so th thank you for the opportunity to give an overview talk here at this um, training event for the medium range weather application. Um, I'm Ricky Rood, and um, I'm presenting on behalf of the co-chairs of the steering committee, which are Hendrick Tolman and myself. And this presentation is, um, is, is not going to be um, compelling, full of figures and exciting, exciting results or anything. I'm intending to give it as a presentation of what the steering committee is planning to do. And 
to tilt it towards those with an interest in the medium range weather application, which I presume this audience has pre-selected themselves. It's going to rely on the strategic plan uh, 2021 to 2025, which I think for those of you who are coming new to the UFS and even many of those who have been involved with it is actually a quite a good document for introduction to the UFS. And it provides entree, it provides some definitions, links to other documents. Um, for example, it defines our applications, it defines our architecture and so on and so forth. Um, an important purpose of that document has been to develop common language and definitions and write them down so that we can refer to them and adhere to them and to develop community policies and practice to support the UFS goals um, in, uh, in a sort of a, a overarching sense. The, the goals are improved forecasts based on solid science, simplified forecast suite, and a better use of resources, both human and computational. And I was thinking about the steering committee, if I were to, to describe it, I, I can imagine NOAA perhaps as a chaotic system. And what we're trying to do is to be an attractor um, to bring some order and ultimately to um, achieve some goals as, as stated here. Um, so the strategic plan by um, some standards is relatively short. Um, it's still reasonably detailed because of the, I think, state of the um, project as a whole where we're at. It's just got four chapters, um, an introduction, a chapter in which there was an enormous amount of work to develop forecast skill priority, science goals and systems goals that would be a focus for the next five years. And then there's some organizational and management priorities and a notional schedule. And uh, what I'm going to do today is just really touch on two or three um, items from this. First, I wanted to give the definition of a UFS application. There are seven applications um, within the UFS of which the medium range weather is one of the seven. And the UFS is a unified system because its applications share a set of agreed upon scientific components and a set of agreed upon infrastructures. The scientific components and infrastructures are integrated into a consistent system architecture and conforming to these UFS, UFS principles is central to UFS planning and success. The agreed upon components and agreed upon infrastructures are um, detailed in chapter three of the strategic plan if you want to um, familiarize yourself with them more deeply. But for example, um, an agreed upon scientific component is an atmospheric model based on the FV3 dynamical core. Agreed upon infrastructures include ESMF, um, NUOPSI, JEDI, MET plus, and CCPP. Hence they're right there in the center of what you'll be hearing about today. Under forecast skill priorities, we collected and generated and presented forecast skill priorities for all seven applications. When we say we collected and generated, um, NOAA had a number of documents that had forecast skill priorities in them. And some of them, quite frankly, did not make sense. However, we decided we were going to still um, collect them and present them so that everyone would know that they were there and maybe in the future we could make them better. And so what is presented here I think is a useful organization and should be used as version zero. Um, as an organization we are updating and improving these and we are striving to integrate 
um, these with the upcoming verification and validation workshop, which some in this group I'm sure are aware of and may be involved in, in its planning. Um, and my last slide is if we have time and there's interest is to go to look at some of those for the medium range weather applications. We want to achieve those forecast skill priorities through a set of science goals. And these are the six science goals that are articulated and described in somewhat more detail um, within the strategic plan. Um, to reduce surface and near surface biases, to incorporate new data types to target specific forecast skill priorities, to test and implement a coupled component capacity for UFS applications, to increase the physical consistency of global atmospheric dynamics and coupling of atmospheric physics and dynamics, establish ensemble based, based methods to describe uncertainty and improve usability by forecasters. And then the last one is to develop an F3, FV3 based whole atmosphere model with deep atmospheric dynamics, which requires um, some significant development um, for um, the dynamical core. Um, with regard to the medium range application, I think the medium range application is, many would agree, integral to, to all of the applications. And hence these science goals, actually um, some people would say they are a little um, perhaps too tilted um, towards um, the medium range application because all of these are, are relevant um, to the advancement of the medium range application. Um, so I just wanted to expand on one of these um, science goals um, for this group. And I chose this one, the increased physical consistency of global atmospheric dynamics and coupling of atmospheric physics and dynamics, um, because I saw the talks on CCPP and the importance of physics um, here is, um, Within those goals, we want to establish a cross-application approach to the representation of atmospheric physics. We want to improve the representation of global to regional atmospheric dynamics and physics. And we want to improve event-based forecast skill. Um, at this point, I want to mention the UFS R20 project, which is uh, a part of the UFS activity that is focused on a two-year time frame and the implementation of key features. And one of the projects in there and its sub-projects is focused on medium range and sub-seasonal to seasonal, which are being addressed in an integrated way. And it has these sub-projects here, data assimilation, coupled data assimilation, coupled model development, model components, atmospheric physics and atmospheric composition. And this should give you some flavor of where the medium range application is headed because we are heading as directly as we can um, towards upcoming releases on the time scale of two to four years. Um, being, you know, coupled model with uh, with we, with with coupled data simulation, um, and the new ensemble model already has coupling um, to composition and waves, so it is at this point um, running a coupled model in in uh, in operations. Um, systems goals. Um, just to give some idea of the things that we are thinking about. Um, we want to improve the interfaces and the engagement of the UFS with the community. Um, I think it's important that we had great success with the graduate student test for the medium range application 1.0. And we want to persist with support and expand the graduate student test, which is this idea of providing code that um, a graduate student um, can download and run within a certain amount of time 
Um, it was called the graduate student test um, because that's what Fred Carr described it in, in one of the UMAC reports. Um, though we have recently received some criticism that um, why graduate students, um, other people want to be able to run this. So, so you know, why, why are they special? But it's still, we're calling it the graduate student test. Um, with that test, we, we, we did, um, you know, actually achieve the goal that, that most of the students who took it before um, were able to run it. It revealed problems that, um, that we could fix. It revealed problems in the test. And you can find reports of the first version of the graduate student test online at the UFS portal, ufscommunity.org, which was listed on the title view graph. Um, a huge activity is simplifying the short range weather and convective allowing model production suite. And there should be a short range weather release coming up relatively soon. And part of that is unifying around the FV3 um, dynamical core. Um, then we want to develop a systematic approach to applications workflow and develop a capacity to support hierarchical systems development, which you can find documents on the portal defining um, our vision of that. And then organizationally, um, we want to continue to develop community engagement and improve cohesion. Um, we want to visit, update, and improve um, those forecast skill priorities and the UFS science goals. One of the things that came out in the review of the strategic plan is the need for better ensemble-based forecast skills. Um, we want to do integration of data simulation into the UFS architecture. Um, there was a JEDI release um, last week, and we are, I think, actively taking on the, um, the, the JEDI architecture within the UFS um, you know, more aggressively than we were a year or two ago. And then the next two are the program office is especially interested in us developing into end test plans. Actually, I say on oh, that one, EMC is especially interested in us developing into end test plans for the UFS applications and defining the stages and gates of the research to operations interface or transition. And um, so those two are the current priorities that we're discussing within the, the steering committee. And this slide, which I got from Deep T in the um, OSTI program office, which is based upon um, the UFS steering committee's document on describing the UFS Ardo interface, um, schematically shows this idea where um, rather than a funnel, uh, we're talking about a stages and gates process where you can imagine here a lot of components being integrated into systems and that there is a, a winnowing or a selection process that goes from low to high technical readiness levels. And so what we're working on right now is to define the, the, the gates that um, go from research to operations. And we're currently looking at a four gate model um, and also defined in this slide are different levels of transitions. Um, and that's actually the end of my talk. And I can link to this forecast skill priorities table if, if we want to look at it. Um, but I will stop there and say, are there any questions or comments? All right, so I don't see any questions in the Slack channel at this point. Um, if anybody would like to raise their hand and ask a question here, please feel free. And if we don't have any questions, Ricky, I would say it'd be great if we could take a look at that table, if you wanna step through that, we definitely have time. All right, 
So yeah, I, I don't see any questions at this point. Uh, just to point out the raise hand feature, it is located in the participants list at the bottom. So if you open the participants list and look at the bottom, you should have the ability to raise your hand. Thanks. Somebody is getting very good with Zoom. <laughs> so, um, so, uh, so a couple of things, if, if you want me to go through these, um, we, up above here, we defined a, a, a set of, of um, types of, of forecast skills. Some of them were called reach goals. And they were drawn from the National Weather Service Strategic Plan 2019 to 2022. And we thought that these should be known and documented, which is why they're there. And then there are some absolute measures that are derived from um, the what NOAA reports to to the um, Government Performance and Results Act, and and then we have a set of benchmarks that are relative to baseline entries, and then following the idea from the European Center of something that they call headline scores, um, we we described a set of, of what we would call um, benchmark um, parameters that are perhaps what you might call of persistent importance. So, um, so these are the ones that were documented and argued over um, on medium range weather. And when I said that, you know, one of them was, some of them might be unrealistic. Well, the, the Weather Service seems to have reported that by 2022, that 10 day forecast would be as accurate as a current seven day forecast. And um, we would sort of like to not see that reported in the, in the future, um, though it is ambitious. Um, in terms of absolute measures, um, where people are really interested in, I've had a number of NOAA managers tell me that um, they will never implement a system that degrades the 500 hectopascal anomaly correlation. Um, but what we have put down here is something that actually seem, seems to be actually quite attainable um, is a day five 500 hectopascal anomaly correlation at 100, um, to be above 0.9 for both the Northern and Southern Hemisphere. And then another one um, was the five, 850 hectopascal temperature um, to reduce the bias there by 0.1 degrees. And, and then what was reported in GIPRA um, was a normally correlation by um, next year to be 9.5, which is probably a little too ambitious. Um, and, and then there were GEF ones, and then the application team itself came up with the reducing the two meter temperature bias um, and recognizing that the bias varies by region, season, and time of day. Um, the reduced precipitation bias um, improved the diurnal cycle of, of precipitation, um, reduced the hurricane track and intensity forecast, especially cross-track errors, and improved the forecast temperature and circulation in the stratosphere and the mesosphere. Um, so you can see here the ones that we would consider um, benchmark, the, 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 the benchmark, um, the benchmark um, parameters are listed here up in the document. They're actually very specifically not mentioned as bullets. Um, are the 500 hectopascal anomaly correlation, 850 hectopascal temperature, sea surface temperature, two meter temperature, two meter dew point, or relative humidity, um, or specific humidity, 10 meter wind, precipitation, especially the equitable threat score, uh, hurricane track, hurricane intensity, and significant wave height. 
um, are listed as um, sort of our analog to what the European Center calls headline scores, what we're calling them benchmark scores. Um, again, I'm, I'm going to be quiet um, and, and see if there are any questions or comments. All right, again, we'll, we'll open it up. Uh, let's see. There is a question from Seaway. Seaway, if you would like to unmute and ask your question, you can. Yeah, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, yeah. good. Yeah, so yeah, because my background is not uh, atmospheric, so, so um, um, it seems the UFS is uh, the system. So I wonder what the would be the main difference between like we have medium region weather forecast, we have the short weather, um, short region weather forecast. So, uh, can you please explain what is the main difference? Like the physics will be the difference, or like configurations, what would be the main difference? That's my question. Thank you. Okay. So presently, there are there are seven applications of of the UFS. I think I'll just go back to those. And in those applications are um, the medium range weather, which has. Um, traditionally been an atmosphere only model, but is now moving towards a coupled ocean atmosphere land sea ice model, um, especially in its ensemble. The subseasonal to seasonal application, um, which is some view as an extension of the medium range um, because of the similarity of the global systems. Um, the hurricane application and the short range weather application, um, both of which are um, use regional models and are also moving to coupled models. And, and um, so they, they have sub substantially different components, but the idea with the architecture is that these components are configured into specific configurations um, based upon what the application is. And there is a component set that has been tested and verified and validated. And then there is a, um, there are protocols of coupling that put together those systems for the specific applications. Um, and then the, the other um, applications here are the space weather application, um, the coastal application, which includes the in, in flooding and storm surge um, models, and then the, the air quality application. And if you go down into the um, section three here of this document, um, you'll, you'll see, see these also in the, in the architecture. But um, if you um, look through here, you will see what the component, the component, the component models are. So you'll see the medium range weather application is is listed as number one and is sort of front and center and is integral to many of these other applications. But there's MOM6, there's WaveWatch 3, the Los Alamos sea ice model, um, go-kart, um, the, the ionosphere, plasmosphere, electrodynamics component, ADCIRC, um, the um, FVCOM ocean model that's used in the Great Lakes and the regional ocean model that's used for some of the, the other um, coastal applications. 
So I hope that answered your question. It was sort of long, perhaps tedious. Yes, thank you. So in answer to Steve Penny, I, I will put that link into the chat, but it's also um, front and center on the UFS um, steering committee website, but let me just put it in the chat. It's also linked in this presentation. All right, any other questions? And thanks to Jeff and Lija also for adding some additional information um, in Slack about the differences between the different applications. That's great. Okay. With a little luck, I just shared the strategic plan with everyone. Yeah, great. Thank you. We'll we'll go ahead and I'll go ahead and put that in the Slack channel as well, just so it's accessible. That's too advanced for me. <laughs> Whoops. Okay. Well, thank you, Ricky. Appreciate your presentation here today. Um, if we have additional questions, we'll be sure to contact you and, and follow up with those. Um, okay. At this point, we are slated to have just a, a quick 15 minute break. So um, we'll, we'll go ahead and do that and go ahead and get some coffee or some water. And um, we'll see you guys back at 1015 Mountain Time. So 15 minutes after the top of the hour, wherever you are. So um, we'll see you then. Thanks. Oh, and we'll leave this session open so you don't have to log out. Just go ahead and um, keep muted and your video off and, and just join us again in 15 minutes. Thank you. Uh, Likia, are you on at the moment? The next presenter? Yeah, Brett, I worked with Ligia yesterday. Ligia, um, okay. So we, we were able to work through some issues but if she would okay. like to hop i was on. just gonna say we could bring up her slide her opening slide now and just have that up in the meantime during the break that would be fine good idea she may have stepped away for a moment yeah okay so, but we okay. we did do a little practice session yesterday so hopefully there won't be any technical difficulties but mm -hmm. we'll <laughs> okay sounds good and i can okay. check back at like a 10 after Perfect, thank so, you. All right, see you then. All right.
We can see your screen now. It's looking good. Oh, if you want to leave up your opening slide, that would be just fine. Great. I just have to um, figure out where to unmute and uh, video buttons work. Oh, okay. No problem. Okay. So I will just put up that slide and then in five minutes, I'll go back and unmute myself. That sounds good. And I don't, I'm not sure. I believe Jamie might introduce, introduce you. So. Okay. Yeah, I'll wait for that. Great. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. All right, hope you all were able to take a quick little break there and get back. Um, our next presenter will be Ligia Bernadette and she will be talking to us about an overview of the UFS medium range weather application for version 1.1. So Ligia, um, go ahead and take it away. All right, uh, can you hear me? We can. Great. Okay, so uh, good morning again, everybody. Uh, this talk, as Jamie said, is the overview of the entire app. So I hope to introduce the various topics that the following uh, speakers that are gonna come later are going to go into more detail about. 
And uh, there's many people that have contributed to the slides that we're going to see here. They are listed on this slide. They come from a variety of institutions. Uh, but in particular, I, I would like to thank uh, Arun Chawla, Louisa Nance, Mike Eck, and Mariana Vertenstein, who are the release co-leads uh, for the UFS medium range weather application that oversaw uh, the process of, of releasing this code. Okay, advancing is not with the arrow. Let's figure out how to go forward. Okay. Uh, oh, so here again, I'm listing uh, the leads for the release. And uh, there was a number of uh, participants from multiple institutions that contributed to get this code ready here for you. And they came from DTC, various parts of NOAA, uh, both NOAA research laboratories like GFDL, GSL, PSL, and NSSL, but also the NOAA National Weather Service uh, with the Environmental Modeling Center Group. Uh, there was a big contribution from NCAR, as well as the University of Colorado series, uh, the George Mason University, and also the team that develops the ESMF software. Uh, this release, in addition to, to having the leads, uh, had several focus teams that worked on specific parts of, uh, of the code to get it ready. So for the model code, the lead was June Wang of EMC. The pre-processing was led by Larissa Reams of NSSL. Uh, the build system was led by Dom Heinzeller of uh, series at NOAA GSL. Uh, the workflow was led by Rocky Dunlap of NCAR CGD. Uh, the testing of the system was led by Phil Pejan of NOAA Physical Systems Laboratory. The documentation was led by myself. So if you have any complaints about that, you know who to contact. And finally, uh, the lead for the support forums was Jamie Wolf. And uh, as Ricky mentioned earlier, uh, we also have as part of this release, the graduate student test. And that was led by the UFS Communications and Outreach Working Group. So this has been a, a major collaborative effort to put this together. Uh, so this, uh, the first release of the UFS is this medium range weather application version one. And the uh, uh, goal of this application is to provide global forecasts uh, for the atmosphere component. So in this code that we are public releasing here, you will not see any ocean model or wave model or sea ice model, or anything like that. So it is an atmosphere only code. And uh, what we're trying to do here is extend the development of the UFS and the use of the UFS beyond the internal NOAA circles and have it extend onto the broader scientific community that is you guys participants of this uh, training. And in order to have this uh, release be usable by the general community, we had some general goals or features that we needed to have in this release. First, it had to port easily to multiple platforms. Uh, it had to enable users to run forecast only experiments, meaning uh, without data simulation, just the forecast part of the system. And it needed to have a user-friendly workflow, so it had to be uh, easy to use. Finally, it needed to have documentation of the entire system and needed to come along with support. So it's not just making the code available, but also there has to be follow-up on how people can use it. Uh, so, so far, uh, we've had two releases of this app. Uh, we released version 1.0 back in March of this year, and uh, we released version 1.1 just very recently uh, last month in October. And the main differences I, I will cover soon, like the, what the overall release has, but just to give you an idea of the differences between those two uh, versions. Uh, the 1.0 could only be run with Python uh, version Python 2, 
while the 1.1 can be run with Python 2 or 3. Another main difference is in the supported format of the initial conditions. So version 1.0 could only ingest initial conditions in the GRIP2 and NEMS.io formats, while for version 1.1, uh, also, the files in NetCDF format can be ingested. Another difference pertains to the download of raw initial conditions. If you used the version 1.0 before, uh, you may have taken advantage of the automatic download of raw initial conditions, meaning you didn't have to stage those initial conditions on disk manually by yourself. However, this uh, capability is not available in version 1.1. Uh, one more uh, new capability of version 1.1 is the ability to customize the UPP, which is the Unified Post Processor Output. So now uh, uh, users of the app are able to choose which variables they want to have in their final output. And uh, finally, uh, for version 1.1, we have done a re revision of the documentation and updated it for the latest and greatest. Okay, so what uh, steps are included in this application? So there's basically three steps. One is the pre-processing and the uh, you know, main uh, software used there is called Change Res Cube. The second uh, component is the model, the forecast model, the one that at is atmosphere only in this case here for this app, and that's called the UFS weather model. And finally, the third part is the post-processing, uh, which is the software is the unified post-processor. So these are the main parts of this app. As you can see at this point, there is no data simulation, there is no verification. Uh, these are aspects that may come along with future releases of this application. Uh, but there are additional components in this application. So in this purple box, uh, we see the workflow, uh, which we use the seam workflow, which as those purple arrows indicate is what uh, drives the system in terms of uh, automatically submitting the jobs or preparing the, the, the name list and executables to run and then submitting the jobs in the proper order. So the data flows from, you know, raw initial conditions to pre-processing to the model and into the post-processor. And another important part of the system is the libraries. Uh, so of course, all these softwares uh, for those components require libraries uh, to be you know, compiled to create the executables. And there are two sets of libraries, which we call the NCEP libraries and the NCEP libraries externals. And finally, uh, we cannot forget that the app comes along with a build system that allows uh, compiling all the, all the codes. So in terms of uh, code repositories for how all these components are, you know, where, where they're housed. Uh, so we have an umbrella code repository for the application. It is on GitHub as it is listed there. Um, it is on the GitHub space called UFS-community. And the repository name is the UFS-MRWeather for medium range weather dash app. Uh, but this is just the entry point repository. There are additional repositories that are sub modules of this main umbrella, uh, but that is not a problem for the, the users of the app because the entire system can be downloaded with just a few commands. So this is just information under the hood for you. And uh, the beauty of this modularity is that we can have all these components which can be assembled for use in different applications. So this is what makes the UFS a unified system. The fact that we have these individual components and they can be used in this app or other apps um, and can be assembled in different ways. 
So looking at that diagram, uh, starting from the left side, we see that blue box that says UFS medium range weather app. Um, so that's the entry point. And under that code repository, there are four submodules. The, 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 those are the green boxes, right? So SIEM, which is the workflow. Then there's these two interfaces, FE3 GFS and NAMS, which are interfaces between the SIEM workflow and elements of this par particular application. And the fourth green box is the UFS weather model. And then in the UFS weather model, we see several subcomponents, uh, the NAMS and FMS, the purple boxes, which are part of the infrastructure of the model. Uh, the FE3 ATM, which contains the basics of the atmospheric model, both the DICOR and the physics. And we have a uh, sub-module also for stochastic physics. And in the FE3 ATM, we see the CCPP, which is aspects of the physics, the framework, and the physics parameterizations themselves. And finally, the Atmos cubed sphere, which is the dynamical core. So that is how the code is organized. Okay, so in the upcoming slides, we're gonna step through uh, each of these components, give a little overview about uh, each of them. So I mentioned before that there were two sets of libraries that we need, uh, the NCEP libraries or NCEP libs as we usually call them and the NCEP libs externals. Uh, the difference between those two is that the NCEP libraries were developed typically by, by NOAA or by NCEP for a specific use in their models, while the externals are third-party libraries. Uh, so the NCEP libraries uh, in the um, code repository, there are a variety of libraries which are listed there, back.io, buffer, etc. There's a, a long list. So that's all provided, as well as uh, the preprocessor, change res cube, and post processor UPP. So just to explain here, typically uh, the change res cube and the UPP are located in their own uh, code repositories. They are not typically part of NCEP libs. However, for the purposes of this release, they have been bundled with the NCEP libs, uh, and that's how they are being distributed for your use. And then the NCEP libs externals, like I said, those are third-party libraries developed externally to NCEP, and they are general software packages that are not specific to, to the NOAA models, such as NetCDF, ESMF, et cetera. Um, and the reason why we are distributing this third-party party libraries is just so uh, we have the exact version that will work with us with the app and also uh, that we know they can be compiled in the platforms that we are supporting. So uh, talking a little bit about the preprocessor, which we said it's called the change res cube. Uh, the function of this preprocessor is to read in the raw initial conditions and I stress the word raw initial conditions because they are not the initial conditions that can directly be used by the weather model. So the preprocessor reads in the, the raw files and creates the initial conditions for the weather model. So what are the sources of um, initial conditions that you guys can use to initialize this app? So at this time, only GFS analysis are supported. So uh, out of the box, you will not be able to initialize the model with say ECMWF analysis or ERA5 or, or anything else. So the focus here is on GFS analysis, but uh, they, there's different formats that are supported. So uh, the initial conditions can be in GRIB2 format, uh, and that can be in either half a degree or one degree. And the advantage of GRIB2 is that those are publicly available. So you can go to the GFS archives and download the data and it's very easy to get. Uh, you can also use the NEMS IO or NetCDF format. So 
NEMS.io is the format that the, G, the currently operational GFS version 16 output uh, its, its files on. Uh, so NEMS.io will give you um, a more complete data set than GRIB2 because it has the full resolution of the GFS and all its uh, vertical levels. However, it is difficult to find these files in NEMS.io format and they are also very large. So in terms of public archives, uh, they're only available online for the last 10 days. So it will be more convenient, more practical to use the GRIB2 files. Okay, now the NetCDF files, as I mentioned earlier, um, it's a new format that was just added for the, the version 1.1 release of the app. And the reason we added this format is that the upcoming GFS version 16, which will be implemented in operations in 2021, will no longer be outputting NEMS.io files, but instead will out output NetCDF files. So if people want to uh, use the forecasts, the analysis of that uh, GFS version 16 to drive the application, they will have to ingest the NetCDF files. In terms of availability of the NetCDF files, uh, those will be publicly available only for the last 10 days as well. So in the same locations where the NEMS.io files are found today, once the new GFS is implemented, we'll start seeing NetCDF files. And there's a lot more information in the user's guide about where, where are those public archives and what are the specific names of the files that you'll have to download to run this app. Okay, so moving on to the UFS weather model. Um, it uses the FE3 dynamical core that uh, our colleagues will be discussing in a later talk. And for this application, there are four grid resolutions that are supported. They're all global uh, configurations without nesting, without stretching, just your plain vanilla global configuration. Uh, but it is very useful to have all these different resolutions. So we have a coarse resolution of C96, which is on the order of 104 uh, kilometers going up to a high resolution of C768, which is approximately 13 kilometers. So the current operational GFS uses the 13 kilometer resolution. So that uh, would be your configuration closest to the operational model. And for the purpose of the public release, uh, only the 64 level vertical configuration is supported, which again is the same as used in the operational GFS. Uh, so in this release, there are two physics suites that are supported. One is called GFS V15P2, and that is the physics used in the currently operational GFS. Uh, but in order to, to stimulate research of uh, you know, what is coming on in the next generation, we have also released the GFS version 16 beta physics set. So what is that? This is uh, a beta version of what will be used in the GFS version 16 implementation, which as I said before, is planned for 2021. Uh, and, but we should be uh, very clear here that uh, when you're using this physics here in this uh, public release, uh, because this public release was created a while back, right before uh, the first was in, in March 2020 was the, the first release of this application. Uh, the physics that is contained is as this beta version was back in October 2019. So recent developments that have gone into creating the, the physics for GFS version 16 are not included in this beta version. Uh, another thing to know about the model is that it can run with or without the near sea, uh, sea surface temperature formulation. Uh, 
this is uh, pertains to how the SST is represented in the weather model. And this scheme, the NSST, can uh, account for diurnal fluctuations of the sea surface temperature. And I'll have a, a further slide, a later slide about this. And finally, uh, when we run the application here, we will be outputting history files in NetCDF format. So, um, sorry, my cat is walking all around here. Okay, moving cat. Um, so the, the, the model, uh, as we mentioned before, has the dynamical core and the physics. So I just have a slide here to introduce the dynamical core, which as we said before is the FV3. Uh, it's developed at NOAA GFDL. And it's a very scalable, flexible, and capable of producing simulations, both hydrostatic and non-hydrostatic, and with a variety of grid configurations. Again, for the purpose of this application, we're only supporting the global configuration with more capabilities uh, possibly coming on uh, later. And uh, a few of the goals uh, that are very important in the development of the FE3 was to use physical processes, principles, sorry, as much as possible uh, when doing the numerical methods and the discretization of the equations and having a strong focus on computational efficiency. And we should note that this dynamical core is already a, a component of the operations of uh, NOAA operations, uh, both being in the current GFS version 15 and in the GAFs V12. And GAFs is the global ensemble forecast system. Oops. OK. So uh, moving on to the physics, right? So uh, as we said, the physics is provided through the common community physics package. And there will be further talks uh, to explain what that is. But for now, I just wanted to say which physics suites are supported with this application. As I mentioned before, uh, there are two suites, the GFS version 15.2 and the GFS version 16 beta. So those lines on the table, they uh, describe the physical parametrizations that are used in each of the suites. And so for microphysics, we're using the GFDL scheme. PBL, I listed there in red because it is the one scheme that differs between those two configurations. So the uh, GFS P15, P2 uses a K profile based, I'm sorry. Uh, cat, you need to go. Added diffusivity mass flux, while the GFS version 16 beta uses a TKE based added diffusivity mass flux scheme. The other parameterizations are the same uh, between the two suites. So the surface layer uh, is just called the GFS surface layer. The deep convection is a simplified Arakawa Schubert, as well as the, the shallow convection is also based on the SAS. Uh, the radiation is the RTMG. Uh, gravity wave drag is based on the unified gravity wave physics scheme. We use the NOAA land surface model. And the uh, radiation parameterizations are parameterization is complemented by an ozone scheme and an H2O scheme that were developed at the NRL, the Naval Research Laboratory. Okay, so I wanted to tell you more about this uh, representation of the sea surface temperature. So first, the app is atmosphere only. I mean, it does have a land surface model, but we count that as, as if uh, it was a parameterization of the atmosphere, but there is no active ocean model or sea ice model. Uh, so how does the, how is the SST represented? It is initialized uh, from the analysis, right? So those are those GFS analysis in, in GRIP2 or NEMS.io or whatever format. And then the SST is forced toward climatology uh, throughout the run. Now, uh, a scheme, a parameterization called the NSST 
the ERC surface temperature can be used for representing the diurnal cycle of sea surface temperature. So this is not like a full ocean model, but it can represent a few physical processes that account for diurnal cycle. However, this NSST scheme cannot be used when we initialize the app with the GRIP2 files. And the reason is because the fields needed to initialize this parameterization are just absent from those GRIP2 archives of the GFS. So the way we're dealing with this in this app is that the workflow will automatically include or exclude this NSST parameterization based on the format of the raw initial conditions that you are using. So as the table indicates there, um, I just realized that this table is not correct. Um, can I fix it on the fly? Apparently not. Um, sorry, a bug has been found, but is on its way to be uh, fixed. Okay. Um, so uh, when we use the NEMS IO or the NetCDF um, initial conditions, then we do have all the fields needed to run the NSST scheme. However, when we initialize the app from the GRIB2 uh, initial conditions, we do not have all the fields and the workflow will automatically turn off uh, this parameterization. So this will happen uh, behind the scenes for anybody using the app. Okay, so we talked about change res, we talked about the model, and the next component to talk about is the, is the PROS processor or UPP. And that is the component that will convert your model output, which is in the native model grid, to something that uh, meteorologists may find more useful, which is information in standard isobaric coordinates. And the output of the UPP will be in GRIB2 format. Another role of the UPP is to calculate additional diagnostic fields that are not part of the model output. Um, so derived fields are based on, on the native model uh, variables. Uh, and finally, as I mentioned earlier, as of this version 1.1 release, we now have the ability to customize the fields in the in these output files. Okay, so we covered those three main components, and now we're remember we have like that that the box that surrounds the components, which is the workflow that builds and runs the, the components. So it is based on the common infrastructure for modeling the earth or seam, uh, which is a Python based scripting infrastructure that provides a user friendly. So with just a few commands, you're able to, to execute this application and it is reproducible in the sense of um, that when you issue these commands over and over, uh, you should be able to get, get the exactly same experiment uh, configured. Uh, as I said, uh, so it's very few commands, just you will have to create the case, configure it, build and run. So it's, you will be very simple. Uh, the seam is developed through open community collaboration on a public GitHub repository. And some of you may already be familiar with the seam workflow because uh, it is a multi-agency development and it's used in other models. So for example, it is used in the NCAR climate model, CESM, as well as the Department of Energy, E3SM, and in this Norwegian model called um, N-O-R-E-S-M, and now also used in this UFS application. 
So uh, the roles of the workflow are first to create the experiment, and that's based on your specification. So you specify the resolution that you want to run, to run like from 100 kilometers all the way down to 13 kilometers, the physics suite, uh, and whether you want to also run the post-processor as part of it or not. After you create the experiment, you can customize the experiment, that is, you can specify which date you want to use, what is the format of the raw initial conditions you want to use, the forecast length, et cetera. Um, you will be able to make changes to the preprocessor or the model uh, name list options. And you can also specify processor layout at the time of customization. The next step is to build the model executions. And note the, the workflow does not build the libraries or the pre and post processor. It only builds the actual model executable. Uh, the workflow be, will create the nameless for you. And then um, there is this aspect of auto downloading and staging the fixed files. So fixed files are not the raw initial conditions that we talked about earlier. Fixed files are things like topography or vegetation tables, soil tables, things like that. The workflow will auto download these files and put them on disk for you. So you don't have to worry about doing that. You also create the job cards and all the dependencies between the jobs. And finally, submit the jobs to the batch system. And the jobs I'm talking about are pertain to running the preprocessor, the model, and if you choose to, the post-processing. OK, so uh, the build system is you know, a very friendly build system that invokes CMake before building. And we are supporting the Linux and Mac operating systems. And as far as compilers, uh, we're supporting the Intel and new compilers. Um, as I mentioned before, there are prerequisite libraries. Those are the NCEP libs and the NCEP libs externals. But our, our build system also provides a single command ability to build those libraries. Also, I'm listing here that these libraries are already installed in pre-configured platforms. So depending on the computational platform you're using, uh, you may not even have to install the libraries yourself. Okay, so past the libraries, um, the workflow is the, the part of this app that, take, that takes the responsibility of building the UFS weather model, and that's done with a single command. So I mentioned on the last slide about this pre-configured platforms already having the libraries. So here I wanted to introduce to you the different levels of platform support that we have. So level one is this pre-configured platforms. The libraries are already there. Uh, the workflow and model will build and run out of the box. And we have done, we being the release team, have done comprehensive testing of this before the release. So this is where you're gonna find it most the easiest time are running the model. And in those uh, light blue boxes, you see which actual platforms fall in this category. So we have the NCAR Cheyenne uh, using either the Intel or the GNU compiler, and also the NOAA, Hera, Gaia, and JET machines using the Intel compiler. In our second level of support, we have what we call configurable platforms. The libraries are not installed, but they are expected to install pretty easily. And we provide you with commands to do that. The workflow and the model are expected to build and run. And we have conducted comprehensive testing before the release. So in that category, we have uh, the Mississippi State University Orion with the Intel compiler, the tech, uh, Stampede with the Intel compiler and the NOAA WCOS, again, with the Intel compiler. And finally, uh, we have level three limited test platform uh, in which we expect things to work 
Uh, we expect the libraries to install, we expect the workflow and model to build and run, but very limited testing has been conducted. And you can see there uh, in the light green, in the light blue, uh, which platforms we're referring to. Okay, so documentation for this app. Uh, there, there is a lot of documentation that has been developed and uh, you can see all the, the list here of the different documents, both for the app as well as for the components, the change res, the model, FV3, et cetera. Uh, in the app user's guide, uh, you will ha have information about how to use the workflow to configure a case, how to run the application. You'll find all these links that I just also showed to the component documentation and uh, links to the UFS user support forum. So it's a great entry point for this app. Okay, support forums. So these are publicly available forums where you need to register. And then after you do that, you can post any topics and you can also respond to other people's questions about their, uh, well, you can respond to their questions. And there are several sub forums available. Those are for build dependencies, initialization, post-processing, et cetera, all the aspects of the app. So it really encouraged the participants to, to go check out the forums and register and see if we can uh, start creating a vibrant community of helping each other out as we learn this application, learn and use it. I also wanted to point you out to a resource, which is the medium range weather application wiki that is listed there. And in this wiki, we have uh, information for developers such as release notes, known bugs, we have policies of use, and we also have examples of, uh, you know, which output you can expect when you run the model. And these outputs are based on the case of the Hurricane Dorian of 29th August, 2019. And we also have available scripts uh, for generating figures from the model output. Ricky mentioned earlier, uh, Ricky Rood, uh, the graduate student test. So again, the graduate student test is a measure for us um, you know, who are working on the UFS project to know if this product we're giving you, this model code is easy for you to use. It is uh, helpful for the work you need to do in your studies or in your job. Uh, so we would really appreciate if you could enroll to take this test and uh, give us feedback on how this, uh, this code you know, how, how user-friendly it is. And you don't have to be a graduate student to take the test. Uh, anybody can take the test. And it will involve running the application in a default setting, but also making a, a change in the name list, rerunning and comparing those results. So we just wanna know if that is easy for you to execute. I wanted to mention that uh, we have a project of case studies that uh, illustrate the use of this application in various uh, forecast situations that are challenges for, the, uh, for this application. So Ricky uh, mentioned earlier that the UFS project is trying to improve several aspects of the forecast like anomaly correlations or biases, et cetera. And we have several case studies here that can um, that illustrate the problems. So I would also encourage you to, to check out this resource. Uh, you can run those case studies. We provide the initial conditions for them, for you to run them. And you can get your own results for these cases. As you can see there on the left, we have hurricane cases. We have mid-latitude storms. Um, we have uh, uh, challenges pertaining to surface planetary boundary layer inversions. And uh, you can use it not only to reproduce the cases, but if you have some ideas about how to improve the forecast, you can use these case studies to demonstrate uh, how to do that. 
I also want to uh, encourage you to join the UFS community in general by engaging in a variety of ways. So I wanted to, to list here that we are a very diverse community and people have different missions if they are doing studying or they have a, a job that involves forecasting. Uh, but there's many ways to engage with the UFS. One is, you know, if you run the model and you analyze the results and you find something interesting or noteworthy, please share it with us. For example, through the forum or giving a presentation at conferences or through publications. If you find bugs with the code, please report them by, via, via the forum. Uh, you can also ask and answer questions in the forum. You can take the graduate student test. Uh, you can participate in the NOAA Notice of Funding Opportunities, which we refer to as the NOFOs. And those uh, come every once in a while, you'll see those funding opportunities. You can participate in the Developmental Testbed Center Visitor Program, and we are uh, open to receive applications right now. So if there's a link there, or if you go to the DTC front page, you'll also find a link to our visitor program and you can apply to be funded to work with us. Uh, the UFS has a newsletter that you can keep in, in touch with what's going on, and the DTC also has a newsletter. Finally, we host an annual uh, UFS users workshop. And the, the last way to, or maybe it's not the last, but yet another way to contribute to the UFS is to develop code. So all our code repositories for the UFS are on GitHub and they are uh, publicly available. The code is open. And you can see here the umbrella for the UFS uh, weather app, as well as uh, the umbrella for the UFS weather model and all the other components of the app. Now, uh, on next Monday, you're going to have lectures about how to contribute to develop. And what I wanted to emphasize here is that uh, you will have to switch from using the frozen code or the tagged code that is uh, distributed with the public version and instead use the top of the repository code, the current code, so that you can contribute uh, those innovations. I also wanted to uh, explain a little bit about how this application works in terms of being used for operations and research. So the way I like to think about this is that this medium range app encompasses both operational and research. So it is this uh, beige you know, oval there on the screen. And from this uh, bigger set of capabilities, it is possible to configure uh, the model like it works in, in operational configuration, which for this app is the GFS, the Global Forecast System. But we can also configure the code for research configurations. The public release is one of those research configurations, but this general code can also be configured uh, for other types of research configurations. And this uh, um, slide here just mentions how this public release differs from the operational model. And Feng Ling uh, may talk more about this in his in his presentation. So the main goal for the public release is to have very portable and friendly code, while the operational model, the GFS, has other goals. For example, it has to continuously run. There can be no failures. So for that reason, they are each distributed with a different workflow. Here, we're using the SIEM workflow, while the operational uses a different workflow, which we call global workflow. The initialization is different. Here we just start from the operational GFS analysis while the GFS runs with continuous data assimilation. For the physics dynamics interface, here we are using the CCPP, while the operational today uses the interoperable physics driver and has a target to switch to the CCPP with the version 17 of the GFS coming up in the future. And finally, uh, we do not have any forecast verification built as part of this app, but of course there is some in the GFS um, operational model. 
So this is my last slide, uh, just looking ahead. So we believe there will be continued development of different UFS applications. It, this has been a very vibrant community thus far. And in terms of public releases of applications, uh, we plan to have the short range weather application release later this fall. Uh, it's targeted for December of this year and later on of the hurricane application and also couple model capability and data simulation. So uh, thank you. I think I may be a little over time, but uh, hopefully there is opportunity for questions. Yeah, thanks, Alicia. That was a great overview of the application and a nice preview of um, what we're going to be seeing in more detail over the next few days. So really appreciate that. Uh, we did have one question in Zoom uh, from Robert. He asked, why did the development team get rid of the automatic initial condition downloads? Um, Ufu did respond and basically was saying that the, there was naming inconsistencies in the public data and it was um, organized, it was it, difficult um, the way it was organized to actually retrieve the correct files. Um, so that, that um, capability was discontinued. I don't know if you have anything else you'd like to add there, Lija, on that particular question. That's basically it. The website, the NOAA website, where we used to go and download the, the initial conditions, where this was decommissioned, and a new website was stood up, but the, not, the naming of the files was very inconsistent. There were problems there. So uh, it just it's not easy to automate this problem, this retrieval at this time. So this may come back in the future releases. Great. OK, um, I didn't see any other questions in the Slack channel, but I did want to mention that um, I added into the general Slack channel a link to the applications user guide, as well as the forums and the app wiki. Um, if there's any other links that might be good to include there, Alicia, um, please feel free to add a few more there if you'd like to. And um, for the participants, uh, feel free to head to the Slack channel and, and have access to those directly. Um, one other thing I wanted to mention is that Alicia mentioned uh, there are four different grid resolutions that are supported for this particular release. Um, but for this training event, we will be sticking to using either C96 or C192, um, simply for the fact that we are using, we've got limited resources, we're sharing those resources among the participants, and we only have a certain amount of time for this particular training event. So um, for those reasons, we will be using only C96 and C192. Um, so please, please be cognizant of that when you're selecting the grid resolution that you'd like to run. Are there any other questions? Oh, I just see another one pop up on Zoom. Um, Dave, if you would like to unmute and ask your question, you, you're certainly welcome to. All right, maybe I'll just read it for you. Um, so there's a question here from David Ovens. I see that building the model is part of the workflow. If you're doing daily forecasts, just changing initial conditions, can this step be skipped? Um, so the, this, um, the workflow at this time, it will not automate uh, your, you know, running every day it's not set up for like a real time forecast system. So I'll just say that there's a, the workflow is more set up for a case study in which, you know, you are just executing the steps of running a case. But if the model is already built, um, you can change the initial date and you don't have to recompile the model. And that, that is something that we'll be um, working with in our practical session. I believe it's tomorrow. So um, stay tuned for more information on how to just change the date. All right. Um, that was the only other questions I saw. I don't see any hands raised at this time. Okay. If you do have any other follow-up questions, please feel free to add those to the Slack channel. 
Otherwise, thank you, Lija. And um, we'll go ahead and switch over to Lori's screen. And Lori will be presenting on the steps to build and run the UFS medium range weather application. And we can see your slides, Lori. Okay, um, can you hear me okay? Yes, we can, thank you. Okay. I think I got everything set up right here. Um, so hello everybody and um, welcome to the next session of our training um, this week. Um, my topic is uh, very interrelated with what Lisa just printed or presented, but it's uh, more focused on the steps on how to build and run the app. Um, I'd like to first acknowledge my colleagues who contributed to this presentation, uh, Julie and Lin Lin, who were introduced earlier today, and of course the whole rest of the medium range weather app team who helped develop all of this um, software. Okay. Um, so the, the UFS medium range weather app, Lisa described in much more detail than what I'm covering here, but I just wanted to remind everybody, I think seeing things um, multiple times in different perspectives is always helpful. Um, it, there's many components and some of those components have subcomponents. So it's a, a nested hierarchy of software that gets a little complex to understand at first. Um, so the NCEP Lives, Lisa talked about, and there'll be a presentation on this tomorrow with more detail. Um, it's a collection of third-party lives, as well as a collection of NCEP developed libraries and source code. Um, with this medium range weather app, um, the NCEP libraries installation also includes the pre and post processing. So that's something that's a little bit unique. Um, so the, the app build is only building the model part. Um, the UFS weather model is the um, forecast model component. Um, this can be configured in many ways as was already described, short range, medium range, seasonal, coupled, uncoupled. Um, so for the medium range weather app, it's a global configuration um, without a coupled um, ocean, ocean ice, et cetera. Um, let's see. And then SEAM is the workflow uh, scripts that um, configures and builds and runs and runs some regression tests if you'd like to do that. Um, so all of these are the, the kind of top level components of the medium range weather app. Um, this is a little bit different per, uh, diagram that shows the um, hierarchy or the dependencies. So one starts with NZEP Libs external, builds the NetCDF, ESMF, other libraries like that. Those are required to be built before you build the NZEP Libs, which is things like GRIB libraries and other you know, IO libraries and um, math libraries and such. Also includes EMC Post and Change Res Cube for this um, application. Those NCEP libs are then required before you can build the UFS weather model. Um, the UFS weather model has several different subcomponents: the dynamic core, the CCPP physics, the NEMS, etc. Um, and then SEAM is used as a, a scripting workflow system to control all of the build and run of that weather model. So once you're done building all of this, you'll have three executables that are required to run the entire workflow. So change res cube is a preprocessor. There's a talk on that tomorrow. The ufs.exe is the weather model itself and then NSEP post. So we'll be hearing more about those as we go. Um, I, I added this slide in because there's uh, links to the documentation for the medium range weather app here. Uh, and I think it's very useful to start at sort of the beginning of this app and then dive down into the different parts as you um, need to know those pieces. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, also on this slide are a shorthand list of steps to build and run the SEAM workflow. Um, I'm gonna be going through each one of these in a little more detail now. Um, there will be another talk about SEAM itself, um, I think right after lunch. And so there's a, a tremendous amount of 
um, configurability with seam and options and such. And I'm just going to talk about the real basic ones here. Um, this presentation and the practical session this afternoon will follow the general um, steps that are included in this link here with the workflow quick start. OK, so the first step is to clone the code. These are all GitHub uh, hosted Git repositories. Um, and the command here says start at the UFS medium range weather app um, and get the public V1 release. Um, oops, sorry about that. Uh, so uh, let's see, I wanted to also mention briefly here that this uses um, a utility called manage externals to check out the external repositories. Um, so there, there's a, a number of different ways to include um, submodules in a Git repository. Um, one is with Git submodules and the other is with this manage externals tool. It allows us to point to all the different versions of all of the different parts of all of the different code that you need to run. Um, so I, I also wanted to mention once again that we'll be doing most of these steps this afternoon in the practical session. So this is just giving you an introduction to what those steps are so you can sort of feel the flow of it. And then this afternoon, you'll do it hands on and be able to ask questions. Um, and as a reminder, the code hierarchy that I've been talking about, it starts with the weather app and it has four sub modules or sub components, the UFS weather model, the NEMS and FE3GFS interface uh, components and the SEAM workflow. The UFS weather model has four different subcomponents: stochastic physics, the FE3, the FMS, and the NEMS. And then FE3 has three more um, submodules for the CCPP physics and framework and the dynamic core, the atmosphere cube sphere. So it, there's a lot of repositories to manage and a lot of repositories to pay attention to, especially as you get um, to the point of maybe wanting to do development in these repositories. For now, you know, the top level tools kind of handle all of this behind the scenes, but I think it's important to know um, that this is all going on behind the scenes so that if there's any issues, you know where to look. So once you've cloned the repository and I'm gonna, I, I forgot to mention this on the previous slide. If you're not familiar with using Git version control, um, there are many online tools on introductions for Git, and that might be worthwhile to do because it's a, a common um, version control system and it's widely used in UFS and it would be um, worth your while to become familiar with what Git does in terms of version control. Okay, so we've cloned the repository, we've got all the source code on our local disk, and now we need to set up the environment. Um, so prior to building the model, and prior to running any of the seam setup steps, you need to set a few um, different environment variables. And that would be you know, with either set or SETI and V, depending on if you're using bash or TCSH, et cetera. Um, but they're pretty common uh, variables that you need to configure your system. Uh, UFS input is a path to the um, input data files. And there's a, directory hierarchy that needs to be located under this directory. Um, for our practical sessions this afternoon, we, we will be using a shared um, input directory and those instructions will be on the practical session website. Uh, UFS Scratch is used as a shorthand for a writable directory where the output files will go for all the cases that you're going to be running. Uh, UFS driver and SEAM model are two settings that are needed by SEAM. Uh, the defaults are NEMS and UFS and should not be changed for this um, training session. Project is an environment variable that lets you set what project account your batch jobs are going to be charged to. Um, so in the instructions for this afternoon, we'll define what project you should use on Cheyenne. Um, but if you're running this later, you have your own machine, you'll need to set that project to however your machine does um, accounting. Uh, so after you've set up those um, environment variables, you've got your code all 
um, checked out onto your local disk, um, you need to create a case. And uh, I'm just gonna cover kind of the top level description of what a seam case is, but um, there's, there's a lot of things you can change and configure in this. Um, and they're usually changed with uh, arguments to the command line. So create new case is the command in seam that you would use. Um, you can give your case a name. Sorry about that. You can use, uh, or you can select a comp set, which we'll talk about in a minute. You can select the grid resolution and what workflow you want to configure. Um, so the, let's see, the, the comp set for the medium range weather app is primarily selecting the physics suite that you're using. Um, as Lisa mentioned, there's two physics suites available, the V15.2 or V16 beta of the GFS. Um, the grid is the model grid resolutions, C96 through C768. Uh, and again, a second reminder, we'll use a low resolution cases for our practical sessions because the high resolution uses a lot of computing and takes a while to finish. So um, we'll just uh, practice with the low resolutions. Um, there are two workflow choices for the medium range weather, one that includes both pre and post processing steps and another one that just includes the pre-processing and model step, so skips the post. So if you don't have any need to run the post processor to generate grid, you could select that workflow. So this is the, the concept of a seam case. And um, if you change anything in the case, you'll need to rebuild the case. And that's where the source code um, compile step would have to happen. And as you'll notice, the date and time isn't listed here. So you can change the date and time of the case you wanna run and not need to rebuild. But if you want to change physics or change resolution, you do need to rebuild. So these are the commands that we'll use to create a case on Cheyenne. So it fills in some of those um, arguments. We'll put a scratch directory someplace um, for our output run directories to go. We'll select a comp set. We'll select a resolution. And we'll select the full workflow end to end. It creates a new um, directory for you. And if that directory already exists, it will uh, give you a warning and exit. So you can't overwrite an existing run directory or case directory. Let's see, I'm just checking my notes to make sure I wasn't gonna say anything else about this. Okay, so the create new case is run from your source code directories. And once you've created a case, you will CD into that run case directory and run all the rest of the commands from that case directory. So that's this last step here. Um, the next step is to do the case setup command. Um, this creates scripts from templates that are needed to build and run the model based on the selections you've made in your case um, create command. You've got a build directory now, you've got a run directory now. Um, the build directory after um, you've run the build step will contain the executables. Um, the run directory is populated when the case gets run. So after the case setup, you'll run the case build command. So these are all seam commands and you'll hear more about these from Ufuk later in the um, later this afternoon. So the build step um, builds a weather model executable and it links in the fixed files that you need. So it will download the fixed files if it can't find them. Um, it will link the fixed files that you need into your run directory. It will link um, the executables for the pre and post processor from NSAP libs so that they show up in your build directory. Um, it takes you know five to seven minutes or so to build this on Cheyenne. So it's not a huge time commitment to rebuild it um, and play around with different configurations. And we'll do that this afternoon. Uh, so once you've built the source code and built and linked all the files into the right places, we'll run the case. And the command to run the case is case.submit here at the bottom. 
But before you run the case, you have an option to change um, some of the settings for the case. Um, there's some of the settings are XML settings, like the wall clock time and the number of hours of forecast you want to run. Um, there are also ways to change the name list input for the uh, model. Um, and there are several useful commands provided by Seam to look at all these different options. XML query list all will tell you all of the different things that you can change with XML. Um, preview name list will generate your name list so that you can see if the settings are what you want to run with. And then preview run will show you the jobs that will be submitted to the batch queue. So you can see if you have your layout and all of that correct. Uh, so yeah, the, so here is where you would change you know, what batch queue you wanted to run, if you want to run on premium or economy on Cheyenne, um, your start date, your model start date and init time. So you can run a 12Z, a forecast from 12Z or a forecast from 0Z. Um, and all of those are options that you can change at this point in the, in the setup. So we've already defined our case with our physics suite and our grid. We've compiled the model code and linked all the fixed files that match those. And now we're kind of configuring the run step. Um, and case submit is a script that will um, configure and submit three jobs, one for pre-processing, one for the model, and one for post-processing. And they will be submitted as dependent batch queue jobs. So one will wait for the previous one to finish before running. Um, and you can watch them run in the batch queue and look at log files and such. So yeah, this is the output that you would see from after you case submit. Um, it will submit three jobs for change res, the model, and post. Um, and we'll give you job IDs if that's um, useful for watching what the jobs are doing. Um, a C96 case takes 10 minutes or so to run on Cheyenne with the current node configuration we've got set up. So you should be able to run um, several different jobs and change things around and see what happens um, within the class time that we have this afternoon. Um, after your job's completed, there's a run directory in your case directory. Um, there's log files for each one of the steps. And then there's you know, model output files, of course, um, the NetCDF files from the model and the grid files from post. Um, so you can examine those and see what's, um, what worked or if there's error messages. And that's it. That's the basic commands to run and um, to clone, set up, and run a job with Seam for the medium range weather app. Uh, during the afternoon session with the hands-on, there's also some instructions on how to um, run a Python script to plot some output fields. Um, and then options to change nameless settings, options to change the date that you want to run, change the, the format um, of the input files. So there's a, a huge amount of configurability available um, and You'll hear more about all of the details of all of these different sections, the seam, the pre-processing, the post-processing, the physics um, over the next two days. But this is kind of the first look at the big picture of how to run a case. And um, I hope that I was able to at least give you a, a hint of what's coming. And if there's any questions now, I think we'd be happy to, I'd be happy to take them. Um, I did finish early and I think that's, um, so there's plenty of time for questions or we can go to lunch early. All right, so thank you, Lori. Appreciate the overview there. Um, I don't see any questions yet in Slack or in Zoom. So if you do have any questions, please feel free. Oh, I do see uh, somebody's hand raised here. So go ahead and unmute and ask your question. Okay, uh, thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, in step number six, run the case. Kind of have a, something there. Maybe if you can go back to the slides. Yeah, just a second. I need to reshare my screen. Now. 
Okay. Okay. So if 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 you want to do a short term forecast, maybe one or two years, then long term forecast like maybe fifty years, what should you do in this uh, section? So this is a weather model, not a climate model. So right now. Okay. 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 It's a weather model. <laughs> yeah. Okay, that is a clear one. <laughs> Not a difference. Thank you. <laughs> but you can change that. So let's see if I can figure out how to get back. Uh -huh. I'm not sure why I'm not um, here. So this um, stop option equals n hours tells okay. the uh, workflow to stop after a certain number of hours. It could be n days or n minutes, I think. And then the mm -hmm. stop n is 24. So this command here will change it to a 24 hour forecast. Yes. Um, the medium range weather app can easily run to 120 hours, the, um, mm -hmm. the length of the GFS. So the that's, is that's after, how you can change it. After 30 can, minutes, what's the 30 here? What's that? The 30, the time, the world clock time. Oh, the wall clock time is how long the job needs to run in the batch queue. Okay, okay. So that you would have to um, kind of configure it for your system. If you're running a high resolution case, you need a longer wall clock time, mm -hmm. uh, low resolution, shorter wall clock time. Um, on some systems, if you have a really long wall clock time, even if you don't use it, it'll take longer to get your job into the batch queue. So that's a batch queue running time. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. We do have another question in Zoom. We can only choose the four resolutions or any or any resolution. So with this release of the medium range weather app, we are only supporting those four resolutions for a global grid. All right, and then another question. Thank you for the presentation. Just to get an idea how expensive CPU-wise the model is, how many nodes and cores are being used in these tests? Um, I would have, I'd have to look that up. I don't know off the top of my head. Um, and yeah, you know, this, yeah, so we can look at that this afternoon when we get to the practical session. Yeah, I, I don't remember off the top of my head either, um, but it, it is in the practical session. Um, if anybody, if any of the other instructors remember, feel uh, free to chime in. May I add something? Please. Uh, for C96, the default configuration use 180, 180 processor, so it's not so expensive. For the highest resolution, C768, you are using 684 processor with four threads. So when, when, the, when the spatial resolution increase, the, the number of processor will increase based on that spatial resolution. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Uh, let's see, another question here in Zoom. Uh, does this system have a rerun option? Again, go ahead. If you, if you, if you finish a run and type case submit again, it automatically restarts from the previous run. So if you want to rerun the same configuration, you might create a new case. Or you can you can you can force the model not to restart. Does that answer your question, Unko? Unkyo? Please feel free to unmute and ask further clarification. Yes, that's all. Thank you very much. All right, thanks. Any other questions? All right. 
Well, I know Lori will be um, with us this afternoon for the practical session too, as will other instructors. So um, we can certainly follow up with any additional questions as we actually get our hands dirty and, and running the model on the system. So um, at this point, we will take a break for lunch, quote unquote lunch, depending on where, where you are. Um, we'll be coming back at 1230 Mountain Time. So that's one hour from now, um, exactly one hour from now. Uh, again, we'll, we'll be leaving the Zoom meeting uh, open. We'll be using the same session uh, for the SEAM talk this afternoon. So um, feel free to um, just join right back into this same room when, when uh, the time comes in an hour. And I did see one question in Slack um, under the practical channel that some uh, Steve needs assistance with the duo authentication setup instructions. Um, so if anybody else has any issues um, with logging on to Cheyenne, please let us know, please follow up and we'll try and get those worked out. Um, we'll also have somebody from Sizzle, um, NCAR's computing division that will be available to help in the first half an hour of our practical session as well. Um, so if, if there are lingering issues, we will try and get those resolved as quickly as possible um, once we get into the practical session. So, but please do give us a heads up if you still need assistance there. All right, any other announcements from anybody else, Ming or Mike, did you have anything else to add? Not from me, thank you. Right. No, okay. I'll just reiterate, uh, please let me know if uh, you still haven't received instructions on how to set up authentication with Duo. Um, we will have somebody on hand to help with that in the, uh, at the beginning of the practice session this afternoon, but the sooner we take care of it, the better it'll be. Yep. All right, so with that, uh, we'll see everybody in an hour. So thank you very much. All right, welcome back everybody. Hope you had a nice break. Um, our first speaker of this afternoon, actually our only speaker of this afternoon, uh, will be Ufuk. He will be talking to us about the SEAM case control system in the medium range weather app. And then after this presentation, uh, we'll have another quick short break and then we'll jump into the practical session. So we'll give you some more details on that um, as we move forward. So. Um, with that, Ufuk, if you want to go ahead and get started, I think we're all set. Sure. Uh, thanks. Uh, uh, I will just continue from the previous presentation uh, that shows the steps to create a case and then modify that one. Uh, I will give more information related with the same case control system that's used in the UFS mid-range weather application. So we as a part of the team at NCAR, uh, I will present this work. Uh, uh, okay, UFS mid-range weather application use SIEM as a workflow. Uh, the, the SIEM basically uh, created in 2000, uh, 15 is a joint collaboration between the Department of Energy and uh, the NCAR. Uh, the, the Department of Energy has still a global coupled climate simulation model called E3SM that you see 
uh, as, a, as a case control system in here, the SIEM is basically an object-oriented Python scripting infra infrastructure that allows the user to deal with the complexity of the coupled Earth system model. So in this case, it's mostly used with the coupled modeling system, but it could be also used the modeling system like standalone atmosphere that's used in the UFS mid-range radar application at this point. So this Python-based scripting infrastructure provides user to easy to easy to create a case, and the created the, the case can be easily reproducible with this uh, interface. So experiments can can be easily created. You can you can you can refer to previous uh, presentation at this point, and it's a it's a it's an open source uh, uh, tool that different peoples from different parts of the world could col collaborate and uh, put new features in it. It's also multi-agency and multi-model. So CSM, E3SM, NORASM, and UFS also using this uh, tool as a part of their application. In this case, it's just it, in this case, it's just used for UFS mid-range radar application, but there is a plan to use in in the house application as a part of their uh, their workflow. So, in in the in the UFS workflow, we have different steps that's shown in the previous slides: create case, set up case, build, customize, and run. But the, when you run the model, it basically triggers three different uh, tasks. The first one is the pre-processing step that's, that, that creates the uh, input files, for initial conditions for the model. And the next one is the forecast. And the last one is the post-processing. So post-processing basically gets the model output and creates some extra diagnostic for you and do some vertical interpolation. So, these are the basic steps. And SIEM basically controls all these three tasks in here to provide user a very uh, easy to use work environment. <clears throat> I don't want to give too much detail about this, uh, each of these steps, but I just want to mention that pre-processing pre is using UFS tutorials and is able to process three different data format at this point, GRIP2, NAMS, IO, and NetCDF. SIM workflow basically triggers UFS utils, basically as changes cube. And changes cube requires a couple of nameless files. And you have to stage the input files for the change rest cube to a certain place. So in the background, if you, if you consider SIEM as a black box, in the background, SIEM uh, creates that nameless file for you. So you don't need to manually interact with the change rest to create that nameless file. It's automatically created for you when you create a case and submit the job. And then it executes the preprocessor. And then this preprocessor using the nameless file and the in raw input file and produce a initial condition for the model based on its resolution. In the forecast step, it's just a running model using the initial condition. But again, SIM workflow basically do a couple of things, things for the user for example, it automatically creates the model configuration. So in this case, if you if you if you think about the model configuration, the UFS atmospheric model use input NML model configure, and all those nameless files is automatically generated in the background for the user in the case directory. And also, Sim provides the ability to use a custom customize the installation date forecast length and model parameters. So for example, if you want to modify some parameters in the input NML or model configure, you don't need to edit those files. You can provide, the, the sim could provide some way to modify those parameters for you without touching original 
uh, files. So by this way, you can isolate your running environment from the source code and the default configuration files. It's a self-contained uh, environment for the user. And then you can easily share that information with other users. Uh, at, at the end, it submits the forecast job to batch system. So you don't need to know anything about uh, Slurm, anything about uh, LSF, different job schedulers. So all those things is generated in the background for the user to, to simplify all those process. As a part of the submission, it automatically stage all required input data sets. This data set basically includes both fixed files for depends on the resolution of the model and also the initial condition. And the last step in the post-processing, the EMC post or UPP is used. Uh, basically that gets the output of the model, the output of the forecast in a GRIP2 format and then create some additional diagnostic fields such as the PBL related with PBL related fields, precipitation, cloud related fields, those are not included into the into the model, the raw model output. So you have to use different fields to calculate all those things. And the same workflow basically do the same thing just did in the pre-processing step. So it automatically creates all the required scripts, nameless file, everything in the background, and then just trigger the post-processing step to to process all the model output at this point. <clears throat> uh, I don't want to give too much detail about that, but we have different level of platforms. For example, Cheyenne is the level one platform that every, the input data is over there and the, the, all the system is ported on Cheyenne and tested well. And Noah, Hera, Jet, Gea, platform is also level one. So you can find different level of platforms in here. Based on the level, you might need to install the external libraries. You might need to do some, you might need to put the in, in input files to a certain place or something like that. So this, this is different in different level of platforms. So if you if you if you go to the tail of sim by the way if you have any question you can ask in in the, in the middle of my talk i just want to give more information related with sim the first one is the when you check out the application there is a sim folder in it and this sim folder has a scripts scripts additional directory called scripts so this scripts directory basically holds all the required commands that's used to create a case. And also it has additional commands that could be useful for the user. For example, the first one is the query config. So this basically query the config. So for example, in the, in the, in the current version of SIM, we have different config files. We have different config groups. For example, for example, CSM is one of them, E3ASM E3 is another one, and we have UFS. So if you, if you, if you for example, issue query config dash dash machines in the, in the UFS application, you will see all the support, supported machines by scene. So for example, you can run the current application on Cheyenne or in other NOAA, NOAA machines, but if you want to run an, an other cluster or another platform, you have to extend the seam uh, for that specific platform. I will, I will give more detail about that at the end of my uh, presentation because it's, it's still a little bit advanced topic. But again, you can extend the seam to work on different platforms. Of course, it's not supported because it's not tested in that platform extensively. But still, you can use SIM in there. Uh, as we see in the previous talk, the create new case is the entry point for the user. So a user could use create new case to create a new case. By this way, the user at least need to provide some information to create new case. For example, you have to give a case name 
it's 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 a, it's a user uh, modified a name for k case, and also you have to provide a comp set that defines the which CCPP suite will be used for this case. So you have two different options at this point, GFS 15 and GFS 16 beta. And also you have to provide the resolution for the grid. So you, you will have four different case in this case. And then it's, it's always better to start with the low resolution and go like that. The, the main uh, power in the seam you can, there are already defined set of tests. For example, if you, if you issue query test list command under this directory, you will see a list of the, you will see a list of the tests like this. So for example, we are testing different configuration at this point. For example, this one is the C, this is the lowest resolution. This is three hour run using GFS, uh, 15 P2 CCPP suite, Intel compiler on Cheyenne. So just by just by running full entire test list, running entire test list, you can you can test full suite of different configuration of the same a model. In in our case, it's UFS mid range weather application, without creating a without issuing create new case for each individual case in this test list. So by this way, you can run all the tests and then you can look at their results and then you can say something about, okay, this for this platform, for this application, the all the tests pass and then you can easily say that the, 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 the model is ported for this particular platform without any problem. So the, 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 there's an example in here in red that use the create test. So in this case, uh, the the create test is runs all the tests in this list, and without post processing. For example, for this test, maybe you don't need to run the post processing, right? But in any case, you have to run the pre processing to create an initial condition for the model. So you can skip the pre processing, but you can skip post processing if you want. But this is not a strict rule. So you can also run the post-processing uh, along with this full test suite. So this will give you a ability to test all different configuration in, in, in a single uh, command. Okay, these are the main sim commands to create a case and query the configuration and other, other information. But after you create a case using create new case command, and if you go to that directory, you will see different commands. So the first one is the case setup. So this is the this, this is the first command that user needs to be issued. Uh, the, in this case, the, the case setup creates the run script, creates the macros files, and user nameless files. So the macros files basically responsible to build the model and to use the flags for the specific compiler. It, it includes the, all the flags for each different compilers. But if you, if you create a case, for example, for the Intel compiler, it will use that part only. Uh, user, I will, I will give more information about the user underscore NL. Uh, this, is the, this is the file that user could specify some customization for the model configuration. For example, if you want to change some setting in the user NML, not, not user NML, sorry, input NML, you can use this file and then you can just put that specific variable to this file and then this will overwrite your configuration. And then after you, you, you set up your case, you can, you can issue the case build and then you can start to build the forecast. So you don't, in this case, as it told before, the seam only builds the forecast. So we are not building the change rest. We are not building the answer post anything. So those, we are assuming all of them is built before. Uh, this is the second main command that user needs to issue because they need to build the configuration. But 
for example, the XML queries are optional. So if you need some information about related with your case, for example, when you create a case, for example, you can forget which CCPP suite is used. Okay. Just by using this XML query command, you can query the CCPP suite and then you can you can look at that information. And also there are lots of different different variables defined with the scene. So you can look at, for example, the case directory, you can look at the source directory. All those information can be queried with this XML query command. The XML change command is important because if you want to change the configuration of your case, you, you have to use XML change. The default, for example, the default forecast length is five day. But for example, if you want to run the model in a shorter time interval, for example, if you want to do a one and a half day simulation, the XML change command can be used to overwrite the stop option and stop N. Stop option can be N hours, N days, N minutes, something like that. And then stop N, the, the number in here. For example, in here, we are defining uh, uh, 36 hour. So it's a one and a half day simulation length at this point. But I will give more detail about this XML change and then changing other, other configuration options. At the end, if you want to see the, uh, if you want, for example, you mind, you, you, you can change the sum option in input NML, right? So before running the model, you may want to change the input NML in your run directory. It's correct or not. So just by issuing this preview nameless file, we'll overwrite everything in your run directory. And just by going that run directory, you can see the modification. So if there is a problem in your definition or if there's something wrong, you can see in your configuration files. By the way, all those commands has some kinds of checking mechanism. For example, if there is an option in the input NML, just accept string. And if you, if you provide, for example, an integer number or float number for it, it will, it will warn you and then it, will, it won't allow you to define a, that number for that string. So there are lots of uh, checking mechanism along with these uh, commands. Another uh, command is the preview run. Preview run basically shows the detail of your run. For example, when you issue the case submit, this case submit could submit only, for example, change res or could submit only the forecast. So just by issuing the preview run, you can see the, all the tasks related with each uh, uh, case submit. So by this way, you can see your uh, see the details of your simulation, uh, the, the the work log time, uh, and other uh, uh, tasks in in your workflow. For example, as as I told you before, you don't need to run the post processing step. So just by issuing it preview run, if you won't see the post post processing step over there, it basically tells you that you need to create a new case if you want to process the, the model output. Uh, another important command in this directory is the check input data. Uh, in, in the Ligia uh, presentation, uh, there, was a, there was a slide related with the, uh, getting the initial condition automatically. So the, in the first release in the version 1.0, there was a capability that you can get the initial condition, the raw initial condition automatically with the model, with the, with, along with the, using the SIM interface. But in the, in the next release, in, the, in this release 1.1, uh, that capability is not available at, at this point. But again, the check input data, you can use check input data dash dash download to download fixed files. So uh, that capability provides the user to to retrieve the resolution dependent fixed files, not initial condition, the fixed files. And, and those files can be still uh, retrieved by the scene without any user interaction. So at this point, we are just talking about the initial condition. So you, you have to get the initial condition manually, but 
the rest of the data required for the simulation can be retrieved by the sim without any problem. Mm -hmm. The another comment is the PE layout. This PE, PE layout basically gives you an idea about the uh, uh, existing case. For example, if you look at the first one, this one, this is the C96, this is the lowest resolution. If you look at the default layout, it used 108 core. So if you are using Cheyenne, it, uh, on Cheyenne, every node has a 36 processor. So you will, you will use three nodes for this resolution. But if you look at the highest resolution, the, the, by default, the threading is activated. So you are using four thread for each MPI processor process. And you have number of tasks is, is 684 at this point. So you have more tasks and plus the threading is activated because this is the default configuration for the higher resolution that could be used to run the model in higher resolution. But of course you can change those numbers and then I will show how. <clears throat> Okay, these are the basic commands that you can use in your case. And also we have a couple of XML file in this directory that you can modify also if you want. So for example, the most important one is the environment uh, ENV machine specific XML file. This file basically defines the module files that's used by the, that's used by the forecast and build. So for example, the, the, the default one, for example, for the if the if the compiler is Intel and the the the, the MPI implementation is the MPT, which is default for the Cheyenne. Okay, then you have to use this module, okay, and this NCEP lib module to 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 for the pre-processing and post-processing. But for example, if you are using Intel compiler, Intel MPI, which is not supported yet with this application. So this is, this is just an entry for the house application. It's another UFS application. For example, that UFS application using different version of ESMF and uh, because it requires newer version of ESMF. So you can edit this file. It's not, uh, uh, we are not suggesting to edit this file because out of box, everything works. And if you edit this file, you might have a, a problem in the build step, but uh, you can go and look at this file, this file and then maybe you, for example, you can update the Intel compiler in your specific case. And if you, if you modify this file, this XML file, and if uh, you need to issue this command, case setup minus minus keep ENV mark a specific XML. Otherwise, when you run or when you build the model, this will overridden. So if you want to keep this customized version of XML file, you have to issue this, uh, this command uh, before uh, case build or case submit. <clears throat> we have also a bunch of different XML file in this case. Um, I don't want to give too much detail about them, but some of them is controlling the runtime settings. Some of them controlling the build settings. You don't need to you don't need to modify those files, but in if you if you are in a case that you have a new platform that's not available in, in the scene and you want to edit, those files need to be created. Uh, correctly to run or build the simulation. So I just, I will, I will give more information about that. And also we have a, some directories under this case root folder. And the, the most important one, the one is the source modes. So for example, if you want to change the source code of the model, okay, if you want to do, if you want to make some experiment, for example, Maybe you want to do some kinds of sensitivity experiments by changing some particular place in the model code. You don't need to go directly go to model source code and then modify in there because you can forget that modification in the source code and then other users maybe use your modification in their case. 
So that could create some kinds of confusion. So because of that, this source modes directory creates a spatial place in each case. By this way, you can isolate your modification from the from the, the, the core source files. For example, if you have uh, some specific file that you want to modify, you can put that file inside of source mods folder. And that file is basically used to build the model for you. So you don't need to go to a, a source model, the real, real source mm -hmm. at this point. Uh, yeah, we, we have also other XML files. Huh, okay, uh, this is another folder. It's under sim root config UFS. So under config folder, we have different folders such as UFS, CSM, E3SM. So if you want to change something in that folder, you have to use UFS. So you have to be careful. For example, if you, if you make some modification in CSM folder, you won't see the effect in your case because you are using UFS as a as a, a as a application so in here we have different fold, different xml files for example this config input data is basically used to define the exter external data server to to get the, to get the input files at least for the static files uh, config grids you can define different type of grid in here but currently we are only supporting four different grids the config files basically the, defines the defines the location of the files that's used by the scene. Basically, you don't need to modify those XML files. The most important part is the subdirectories called machines. So, if you want to add a new platform to scene to run the UFS application, you have to go this directory and then you have to edit couple of files, for example, config machine, config batch, and then, um, <clears throat> oops, uh, sorry about that. Uh, config batch and then uh, other files. So this machine uh, folder is the most important one for the, for the uh, uh, new uh, platforms. For example, let's, let's look at the common uh, 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 common problems. For example, if you want to create a different uh, case for different CCPP options, um, for example, uh, in the in the create new case, you can you can uh, you can you can provide the CCPP suite. You can provide the resolution. You can provide a name for the, your case, and then you can provide the workflow. So. As I told you before, if you use UFS mid-range reader, this will include also post-processing. But if you want, if you don't want to use post-processing and if you want to skip that part, you can you you can you can use different uh, name for it. So, for example, XML change can be used to change different things. For example, you can change the run start date. The default one is the Dorian case, not this one, but if you want to change it to different date, you can change it with, by this way. You can, you can update the run start date and then run start date. This is the time of the day. It must be in seconds. For example, if you want to, you can set it to the end of the day or you can set it in noon or something like that just by using this uh, setting. But don't forget, if you change the start date rather than the default one, you have to responsible to uh, get the data for that specific date from the public server and place in a certain place. Otherwise, the model will try to process the data and it couldn't find and then it will fail. And then you can change the simulation length like this. And also you can modify the, modify the, uh, uh, the, the job uh, wall clock time. In this case, for example, if you are doing a low resolution simulation, and if you don't want to wait too much in the queue system, you can try to reduce this wall clock time, and then you will get some priority in the in the in the list. But 
Another question could be something like that. Okay, I am changing the work clock time for the forecast, but how can I change the work clock time for specific subtask? In this case, the subtask could be a change rate or subtask could be a post processing. So just by issuing the same command with extra flag in here, the subgroup, in this case, it's case dot change rest. This will change the uh, job work clock time for the change rest. And okay, you, you can't remember these names, case dot change rest, but if you issue preview run, you will see the name of each individual task in there. And then you can use same name in here also. The model configuration option can be also modified by user NL, UFS ATM. So for example, okay, we have a different, uh, I, 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 will, I will give more detail about this user NL UFS ATM, but again, you can put particular configuration option in this file and then this file will be used to overwrite your input NML and model configure. So if you want to restart the model, you can do it by explicitly setting continue run equals true. By, by default, it's false. But for example, if you have a run, for example, if you have a run, initial run that successfully finished, and if you if you issue says case submit again for the same case, this will automatically set continue run to true. So it will automatically restart from the last point. But if you want to overwrite it, you can still use XML change continue run equal false, and then you can, you can do the run again. <clears throat> so uh, in this case, if you, if you want to restart the model, the forecast manually, you might you have to edit input NML model configure. You have to stage the data to a certain place. For example, uh, in, in the run directory, there is a restart directory. You have to place all those files from the restart directory to input directory to restart the model. So manually restarting the model is requires a little bit experience in the model, but using Seam and Seam basically handles all those steps for you. You don't need to worry about staging the restart files to input directory. You don't need to worry about the changing the nameless configuration in the input NML or something like that. So all those uh, modification and steps done by the scene in the background for you. For example, uh, both input NML and model configure is modified, are, are modified by scene for the restart simulation. And also restart directory is copied over the input directory. You, of course, you have to also need to rename the files. But after that, you can also modify the restart. For example, if you want to do restart only one day, you can do it like that. Or if you want to do a restart for six hours, you can change that configuration in here. Uh, again, using the source mode, is I think cru crucial. Um, user does not need to modify the model source code under, so under source model. It's not a preferable option in here. Of course, you can go there and then modify the uh, model source code, but rather than modifying source code, the, 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 you can only play, place the modified source file to this directory, under this directory, and then when you issue case build again, the same use that custom file to build the model. <clears throat> and then you can submit your job without any problem because it's, it's a regular uh, part of the workflow. So you can still submit job with the regular command. You don't need to worry about that, but you have to, if you place some, uh, if you place a file under this source mode, you have to build the model again. Another uh, important thing is that, okay, we are sub, uh, the UFS application supports three different types of three different types of data. So you can use them, SIO, NetCF, and GRIP2. Uh, I just want to mention that the GRIP2 is the default one. So uh, if you want to use, uh, and 
if you want to use grip2, you don't need to worry about that. But again, so let's assume that you get the input data, okay, uh, for the fixed files. And, but you have to get the raw initial condition, right? So this is different from the 1.0. So 1.1, you, you have to get those files manually and then place using this convention. So when you, when you, uh, when you define the UFS input and wind variable, you have to create a directory structure like that. For example, this is the year, month, year, month, day. So for example, if you want to start your simulation from 2012, uh, February 2nd or something like that, you have to create a folder structure like that in here. And also you have to rename your row input uh, files based on this convention. For example, if it's a grip2 format, so it must be something like atm.input.ic.grip2. For NetsDF, you have two different files, one for surface, one for a three-dimensional atmospheric state. It's also same for the names IO. So you have to follow this convention. This is also explained in the documentation. You have to follow this convention to, 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 to stage the initial condition, raw initial condition. Otherwise, the, the sim controls those directories, those files. And if you find any inconsistency based on this convention, it will warn you. I just want to point a, a additional important thing in here. For GRIP2 format, you have two different choice. Uh, you can use one, uh, 0.5 degree resolution or you can, you can use 1.0 1, 1. degree resolution. But based on this convention, you can't have both of them in the same directory. So, because there is no any way to uh, define the resolution in here, the, because the GRIP2 convention is something like that. So because of that, if you want to run the model using the lower resolution input, the raw input, and then if you want to run the simulation with higher resolution input, additional, Maybe you are doing some kinds of sensitivity uh, experiment and you just want to look at the, uh, the, the resolution effect in your, the, the raw input resolution effect in your model simulation. You have to delete the previous one and you have to stage another one or you can, you can rename it. So this is the one uh, important uh, trick that you want to use two, dif two different run with two different uh, resolution using GRIP2. Uh, so this is the, this is the uh, getting the raw input files. Uh, after this one, you have to customize your configuration because GRIP2 is the default. For example, let's assume that you want to use the NetsDF. And then uh, after getting the NetsDF data from the public, repo, public uh, data uh, server, you have to edit user NL UFS ATM and then you have to put input type equal Gaussian underscore NetsDF. So after doing this one, and if you, if you run the preview name list, all the name list is created based on this information. So change rest name list, change, for example, if you if you if you set grip to the 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 nameless file that's used by the change rest is different, but if you set it Gaussian names I/O, the 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 nameless used by the change rest is different. So all those differences handled by the seam in the background for you, but you just need to add this specific line to your user and UFS ATM to use different uh, data format at this point. So these are the basic steps to, to, to use different input types. So you can query the, your input directory. You can remove, okay, let's assume that you run the model, okay, with GRIP2 format, and you want to run with NetCDF. The changes, the, the current workflow ru uh, runs like that. So if you, if you run the model first time, the all raw input files are processed and the mo model compatible input initial conditions will be created for you. That's fine. But after this initial step, you can run the model. But for example, let's assume that you are using the same case to test different file format. 
for example, you run the model with GRIP2, and now you want to run the model with NetCDF. The problem is that the, the, you already process the initial condition for the GRIP2, and those are placed in, the, in, in your run directory. So you have to go to your run directory and to remove the previous files. Otherwise, changes will look at those files and see those are exist. And then it won't run. It will just pass. So it won't create a new initial condition for you using the NetCDF files. So because of that, if you, if you are doing two different experiments in the same case directory using two different input type, you have to be careful and then you have to remove those files from your run directory. Otherwise, you won't see any difference in your results because it will use the pre-staged uh, and processed uh, initial conditions. So let's look at the default PE layout configuration. For example, for C96, uh, these are the configurations. This is the total number of processor. This is the layout defined in the input NML. This is the number of write task group, and this is the number of tasks dedicated to write the files to disk. So in this case, uh, you have 12 core just for dedicated for IO. But if you increase this resolution, those number is changing. And for example, number of threads is activated, for example, higher resolution. The layout is changing. These are the default come with the ship with the uh, seam. And there's a certain equation in here that needs to be considered if you want to change those numbers. For example, the A must be equal to number of tiles. In our case, number of tiles is always six because we are using cubesphere grid. But for example, num uh, for the regional application in the house application, the number of tiles is one because it's a regional application. This must be uh, multiplied by the B, four times four times six, plus C multiplied with D. So this, this is the equation that you need to be considered. So for example, for one, uh, 192 resolution, if you want to change the default, okay, this is the default. For example, uh, 180 core will be used. For example, if you look at this equation, this is exactly match. So you don't need to worry about that. But if you want to change, for example, number of task, right task in here, you have to change total number of processor accordingly. Otherwise the model will not submit. And <clears throat> so for example, let's assume that we want to change the resolution. We, we want to change the number of processor in here for this uh, resolution to a different one. For example, in this case, we are just keeping the number of write task is same. Um, I think we change the layout or what do we change in here? Okay, we just change the layout from four times six to six times six. So by this way, if you calculate these numbers and then you can, you can see you have to set the number of processor to 252, okay? So for this modification, you just need to follow these steps. So you have to edit user NL UFS ATM and change the layout to six by six. And then you have to issue XML change number of task underscore ATM to 252. And then you, if you issue these number, if you issue these commands, by the way, seem always force to build the model if you change the number of processor. Actually, it's not, uh, it's, it's not mandatory for the UFS ATM because you can change the processor number of processor without building the model. But this uh, restriction is coming from the CIs. Uh, the SIM also supports the coupled application, but and also CIs needs to be compiled, at least for CIs files, need to be compiled again if you want to change the number of processor. So if there is some mismatch in those numbers, and if you don't follow that equation, the SIM will uh, write some information to you and then it will say that there is an inconsistency in your configuration, so you have to fix it. So in this case, for example, you might need to change the right task per group from 12 to three, uh, 36, 
or you can you can reduce the number of processor in here. So there are lots of different options in here. You can you can follow. So uh, at this point, I just want to mention a little bit about the advanced uh, advanced configuration, uh, and this is basically related with the sim workflow of scripts. So sim basically creates uh, scripts for the pre-processing and post-processing uh, behind. And uh, you can see all those template scripts on, under simroot config, config UFS machines file, folder. So you, in this case, you have two different template script in here, one for changes, one for G, GFS post. Uh, you can you can you can modify those, but it's not uh, it's not uh, preferable. Uh, it's not a suggested uh, uh, way to to modify those because if you do something wrong in here, and the the changes will fail, and if changes fails, the model fails because it it won't it won't find the re required input files. <clears throat> And also in your case directory, you can find the copies of those templates. But when you when you issue case submit, premium name list, something like that, those uh, hidden files, you can see the dot at the beginning. These are the hidden files. These are those hidden files all written. So if you want to make some modification on those scripts, you have to go to config UFS machine and then you have to change those template scripts. Otherwise, you won't see the, the uh, you won't see the effect. Another uh, advanced topic is porting SIM. If you want to port the SIM to a different platform that's not supported currently, uh, for example, I don't know any uh, uh, any different platform, but for example, for example, if there is a something as a something special specific platform in the in the in the some university cluster or something like that, you have to. You have to extend SIM. You have to port the SIM to run on those those specific machines. So you have to you have to edit config machine. Though these files is under config uh, UFS machine folder. So you have to edit config machine, config batch. Uh, config machine basically defines which module will be used uh, to build the model. Of course, you can go that file and then, for example, you can find the similar entry, similar to your new platform. And then you can copy that one and uh, uh, with new name, and then you can start to modify until you get a, a correct uh, build or something like that. Uh, uh, to, to verify your port is working or not, you can run a simple test. You can create a low resolution case or you can run the full test suite and see what happens. But it's always better to start with small steps. So just by using a single case will be enough to test some something in there. So this is an example of the machine file. It's, it's for Orion, the MSU uh, machine. So you can use this, for example, as a reference, and then you can define a new one. And also you can verify this. This file is based on the XML and in the background, there are some scheme, schemes that you can be used to verify the content of the XML because it's easy to make some kinds of syntax error or something like that. So by this way, you can catch those errors uh, and before going the testing the, the case. So config batch basically defines the, for example, the partition, how wall clock time is defined, how queue is defined, how account is defined, all those information is given in here. For example, Orion is using Slurm. So if you are trying to port the, port the SIM to a different machine that use Slurm, then you can use this entry. You just need to edit this machine name because you can't have two, two entry for same machine. And then you can change the name in here for that particular uh, uh, platform. And then you can start editing those options and see what happens. So basically uh, that's all in my uh, presentation. So if you have any question, just let me know at this point. Thank you very much. All right, thanks Ufuk.
lot of information there. <laughs> um, it's, it'll be great to have this as a resource as we go through the practical session. Mm -hmm. um, given that I am going to be putting the a P PDF version of the presentations onto the agenda, um, I'll do that as we get started with the practical session. So if users need to go back and review something from the slides, you will have access to them. So hang on for a couple minutes while I do that, um, but it will be available. Um, and Ufuga, are you planning on being at the practical session as yeah, well? Yeah, I, be, I, be, I will attend all the practical session in this week. So if Great. you have any question, I will, I will answer. Okay, excellent. Um, all right, so Mike, looks like you have a question on Slack. Do you wanna unmute and ask? Yeah, sure. Uh, thanks, Ufuk, uh, for the for the talk. I learned a lot of things I didn't even know. Um, and the uh, the question I had was uh, actually Tracy partially answered it because I forgot that UPP was not built as part of the medium range weather app. It's part of the libraries that are pre built. Um, but my my general question was just that there's uh, there's four directories under the source mods, mm -hmm. um, and obviously the sources source dot UFS ATM is the atmospheric model. Mm -hmm. um, but there's also a few other directories. What what a uh, code is that for? Okay, the source driver basically to to run the standalone atmosphere. We are still using NAMS driver. It's it's a part of the model. So the NAMS driver needs to be used to trigger the atmospheric model. Even okay, we know it's a standalone model, but still you have to use the ESMF driver to 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 drive the. Uh, standalone atmosphere. So driver directories mm -hmm. exist because of that. Uh, the search uh, source that share is basically used by the uh, shared um, shared libraries. For example, the uh, I think UFS ATM is not using the shared libraries, but the shared live. I think the share and the S runoff is the stop runoff. I don't know what's the, why it's over there. Maybe it's, a, it's some kinds of a seam related uh, directory because it's it's basically related with the stop runoff component. So basically the void or stop runoff component. So it won't be in there, but uh, maybe there is there is some back in the same site that creates that also for us. But share eventually used by the, for example, the timing uh, libraries and other shared libraries. So if you want to change something about the shared libraries, that's shipped by the seam itself because ship has GPTL, PIO, etc. All those libraries compiled by the seam in the background. So if you if you want to change anything related to those, you can use source share, but definitely the source S runoff is not the the, the one that I uh, that I expecting to see in there. So uh, it could be a same kinds of a, a bug in the background, but it won't affect your uh, uh, regular uh, 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 workflow, right? So if you <laughs> you can you don't need to use that folder. But others is required, and it's it's generated by the scene automatically. Okay, thank you. No problem. All right. Do we have other questions? I think there was another question related to UPP. So, but it's already answered, right? Yeah. So, if you want to use a other UPP, that's not shipped by the the default. So if you want to change something in there, you, you have to install it into your uh, user directory. And then you have to edit the machine file in your case directory or machine file in your, your, your config UFS. And you have to point that specific NSAPLIP installation. So by this way, you can use your custom NSAPLIP installation by this way. Right. Hopefully, Tracy, that answers your part of the question as well. Follow up if, if needed. I don't see any other questions at this point. 
So, all right, so instructions for moving forward here. Um, so now we'll go into the hands-on practical session. Um, we will be dropping off the Zoom call and in the agenda online, there is a link to a Google Meet and we will be going there to um, work through the practical sessions um, from there. And like I mentioned this morning, if we need to um, have some instructors create a personal Google Meet that they can invite a single person to to answer questions one-on-one, -on -one, we will certainly do that. But feel free to break in and um, ask questions uh, as the whole group, so the whole group can hear and benefit from the answer as well. Um, I will, as we start going with the practical session, put the PDF versions of the slides from this morning on the agenda, so you can refer back to those if necessary. Um, but the hands-on practical session webpage does have step-by-step -step instructions, so you should be able to um, use that to step through. And maybe I'll just share my screen real quick to show you. All right, so hopefully you can see my screen all right. Um, this is the agenda page. If you scroll down um, to this afternoon's practical session, this is where you'll find the information and the link to get onto Google Meet. And then at, when you're at that page in the top right corner, the bottom menu option is for the practical session guide. Um, when you click on that, you will be brought to another page that will um, discuss the different sessions. Session one is today, session two will be uh, tomorrow afternoon and early Friday, and then session three will be the later time on Friday. So those will become the focus of those particular sessions. And then you, there's a little bit of instruction on what the different formatting types mean as you go through. Um, but then you'll go ahead and go to set up and run the model and you'll start the step-by-step -step instructions starting with logging into Cheyenne. So that's what we'll be doing next. Um, we'll go ahead and close out this session um, and see you all in the Google Meet. If you have any issues, please um, go ahead and ask your questions on Slack um, and we'll, we'll be sure to help you get onto the Google Meet as well. So uh, we'll see you over there. Thanks everybody.